Uh, good morning, everybody. Gary Younger. I am the assistant deputy designated federal officer and want to welcome you to today's meeting and uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day. And uh, 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 we're looking forward to a robust discussion today. We, we've got a, a good agenda set up. And of course, uh, uh, we're looking forward to uh, the have providing policy level advice and recommendations concerning the uh, following EM site specific issues, cleanup activities and environmental restoration, waste and nuclear materials management and disposition, excess facilities, future land use and long term stewardship, risk management and communications. And once again, welcome to this meeting. Glad you're here. And uh, Bob. Take it away, my friend. Hey, thank you. So uh, welcome everybody to the uh, tanks meeting uh, for April. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is to review the agenda. And like Jerry just uh, said, we're really into a, a pretty good set of presentations this morning. Uh, a lot of good information. Hopefully, we'll be able to ask a lot of questions. Uh, this afternoon is more of a business meeting, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, the 2023 work plan and calendar and trying to set up uh, the next meeting. And then we also have time for an open forum. So pretty uh, intense meeting all day, and I... Uh, Welcome you guys to participate fully. So with that, let's see, the next thing is approving the February agenda. And uh, I think with Josh and his recording of the, of the meetings uh, really does capture all the information. I had no comments except for, can you scroll down to the attendees? all the way to the bottom. Um, yeah, uh, the, the line that says Bob Suyama, Dan Solis, Estefan, I think that's the same as the very top of that. Yeah, so there's a duplicate there. Oh. And then uh, if you scroll down on the others, there's one that says K. Hey. I wasn't sure who that was. So so one of the quirky bits um, is uh, under FACA and the facilitation contract, we're supposed to keep track of who comes to meetings. Um, however, in an online format, it depends on how you sign in if you're signing in with chat and your name and your affiliation, which we ask you to do, or if you if you dial in and your system shows a name attached to your account, those are the only two ways we know unless in the course of the discussion we pick up that somebody's here. So there are some folks who choose to sign in in ways that make it a little tough to figure out who they are. <laughs> um, so. Okay. Yeah, so that's, it's, it's that's okay to get those odd things. It's okay to have a the K. Yeah, because that's actually how that individual signed in. Okay, and the other uh, you did me up there, but Dan Solis and Stefan are also duplicates. Oh, Esteban, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> that's actually why we put this disclaimer down at the bottom. Um, a little awkward okay and we don't we don't identify the phone numbers who sign in because that would be like outing someone's private information so we don't always catch who's on the phone okay so we're open to any other comments changes things that uh the members felt needed to be uh modified on the minutes anyone
So uh, hearing none, I propose that we accept these meeting minutes uh, as for the February meeting. Let me also, I forgot, <laughs> I forgot to announce, we do record these meetings. So um, your comments, the chat, we are being recorded. Um, and after the meeting, in addition to the draft meeting minutes, um, the recordings are posted on the Hanford website as well. For those who want to go back and check out a, a piece of the meeting and look. Okay. So I haven't heard any comments, so uh, let's assume that, that we're good to go. Any other um, announcements? Uh, Gary, anybody? No additional announcements at this time, Bob. Okay, thank you. So we're a little ahead of schedule. Uh, do we have all our speakers for the next uh, agenda item? Like we have all three. Okay. 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 So um, let's proceed. What we're going to talk about next is the uh, direct feed, low activity waste uh, uh, discussion, and it's also going to touch on the tanks and uh, the Tisker. So uh, we have three very uh knowledgeable people from uh, doe to take us through this uh, i'm not sure who's going to start it off tom tom, tom, tom. i'm on mute so i'll uh, <laughs> i'll kick us off so the idea here is a really a conversation so the presentation really is less of a presentation of more of a conversation so feel free to raise your hand uh, we'll kind of present a, a slide and then have a dialogue on what we've presented. Uh, we were able to use this about a month ago, Delmar and I were with the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board, and this process worked really well to uh, engage with you all um, and work our way through it. So if we can go to the next slide, what, what we learned actually, and what I'll say as a lesson is what we learned in that was um, is to have a couple slides. Uh, so what's being brief, we're going to brief you today on the updates of the direct feed low activity waste program, uh, tank farms and Tisker or tank side season removal system. Uh, and Janet uh, Dedeker is on, on the call with us as well today as the FPD to help provide some uh, real time status. And then of course Delmar knows it too, but real time status of the tank side season removal system. Uh, from a HAB perspective, this is all informational. Um, we're continuing to make progress and no advice that is requested as part of this briefing. Going on to slide three, uh, and I think everybody's seen this slide, but this is a really good picture of showing what it's going to look like when we get into operations of DF law. And there's going to be two slides here that we'll talk through. This one provides the whole site-wide picture, and then the second one is more specific to DF law. But if you start here, um, where this little green arrow is, it all starts here in, in tank farms. Really, that's where we are taking the tank waste, going, send it through the tank side cesium removal system, removing um, the radionuclides, storing that into uh, the tank for AP107, and then ultimately transporting that, oh, sorry, that's AP10, yeah, a, transporting that over to um, AP106 which will be the transport tank. So it'll go into AP7 for space staged into Tisker, out of Tisker into AP6, AP106, and then from AP106 over to the waste treatment plant for vitrification. And as we know in vitrification, um, for every gallon that comes in from a waste stream standpoint, I know I've told you all this before, two gallons is created in off gas. So we then use the effluent management system um, followed by the liquid effluent treatment system and the um, effluent treatment facility to manage that uh, liquid discharge. So really two streams come out of the law facility, glass logs that will be transported to IDF for disposal and then liquid being treated or being um, 
separated through the effluent management facility, uh, removing the um, halides, chlorides, sulfides, putting those back into recycle, and then the overheads along with the caustic scrubber stream will go directly down to the LERF facility and ultimately be treated through the effluent treatment facility. So that kind of provides, I'll say, the 50,000 foot overview of the DF law program and process. And what else you show on this screen is all of the ancillary projects um, that support that, the roads, the emergency, uh, the power, uh, the telecommunications, the water utilities, all of those are shown on this chart um, in orange. And a lot of people don't really think about the, the amount of effort that goes into it from an integration standpoint. The last piece of that is, of course, AUCMED uh, and the support they provide both to, to the Hanford site to ensure that our workers have um, AUCMED support. If uh, something were to go wrong, um, we have that capability available and ready to support uh, abnormal operations, not that we expect those. And, and our day-to-day -day, physicals and all of that that's required just to do our job uh, on the Hanford site. So that provides a high-level overview. Um, and, and Delmar and I, and, and Delmar, I don't know if you want to jump in and say anything in addition, but uh, want to make want to start there. No, go ahead. To like uh, like uh, Tom said, we'll be jumping back to this and and talking much more in depth on the status and progress and activities that are happening. Uh, within the DF law program, as well as some of those key activities that tank farms are doing outside of that. Uh, so we'll be returning to this and talking about it more as we go through. So if we flip over to the next slide, this one this one hones us in a little closer into just DF law and the tank configuration, as well as the line. I think everybody has seen this diagram. Um, I'll ask Janet to give us a kind of a heads up, it's kind of starting with the waste. If we can start with tank stage cesium removal, I think that's probably the best spot and, and I'll say the most progress um, in, the, in the operational highlights. So Delmar and Janet, if you want to start there, I think that's probably the best spot on this slide. Okay, um, well, before I hand it to, to Janet, Janet uh, and, and uh, she's the FPD for this project and, and her and a very large team work tirelessly with our contractors to get us where we are. Uh, but, you know, overall, I'm proud to say that um, we have treated the first batch of waste um, and are actually changing out the columns as we speak. So we have 197,000 gallons of treated waste in AP6 moving towards a million gallons to feed uh, the vitrification plant that Tom was constructing when it's ready to enter hot commissioning. So with that, Janet, do you wanna share some of the project uh, successes and scope? Sure, thank you. Sorry, I got one of those seasonal allergies, so I apologize um, in advance. Um, it was, um, like Delmar said, that literally was hundreds of people that led to the success of the tank site season removal. This included, you know, um, WRPS, um, our subcontractors, whether it was fabrication of long lead equipment, um, the design um, folks and construction and um, our readiness activities which was very um, complex and carefully orchestrated by um, our team. And that led to the successful start of the operations, like Delmar said. One of the key things that happened um, this week, uh, I think when I, the last time I briefed you, we talked a little bit about critical decision 4A, which allowed us to initiate the operations of the system. And then um, uh, yet on Monday from Ike White, we um, achieved the critical decision four. So 4A was accomplished in uh, January of 2022. And then um, we got CD4 approval this past Monday. And um, what that allowed us to do is now we have completed um, the, uh, the, the approval for the transfer line the waste feed delivery in infrastructure and we have done our key performance parameters and we have successfully fabricated this system 
like Delmar had initially said, to allow operations infrastructure to pre-treat our waste within the acceptance criteria of the waste treatment plant, low activity waste. Uh, another big success was uh, the ability to hold to our and exceed our congressional baseline, which was uh, July of 2020. Two, we accomplished this ahead of schedule. And also our TPC, our total project cost, was 164 million, and we brought this project in um, at 135 million. So that was a success story, um, especially you know given the fact that uh, we were shut down for nearly a year um, due to COVID. Um, I'm going through a few notes here. Um, one of the things that was really beneficial uh, for the project is um, working with other sites, predominantly Savannah River, on lessons learned. And um, I think that helped us all um, very much. So, you know, one of the things that we tried to do is sharing um, information and resources from other sites. We, um, and that was primarily with Savannah River, like I said, on the tank closure cesium removal system. That is a different system, but it has similarities. The other thing that was a, a you know lessons learned that I'm currently working with UPF on right now is that we engaged with our regulatory agencies as soon as possible and established regular interface meetings. We ensured that there was adequate staffing for all phases of the project. Uh, occasionally, that was a challenge given um, you know the COVID situation and people being out. But as mentioned, we um, recovered that. One of the things we will do if we build a second or another Tisker or whatever uh, we choose to do, and I'll talk about that in a moment, is that we would ensure a control system simulator is procured early as it as possible during the project execution because it provided an opportunity for our operators um, to to practice and then um, one of the things is of course around here we have all the wind and well right now we have snow but um, we uh, would be uh, looking at an all season weather enclosure uh, for any potential contamination areas into the facility's design so the next step that um, the department um, or ORP will be taking as part of the project execution plan that was approved is the Tisker system is um, going to be operating up to five years. And uh, we have um, already worked together on some of the things that we would need to do with the Department of Energy of environmental management to initiate what's called the alternative of analysis. So we plan to do that soon. Uh, we will comply with DOE 413.3B, as well as the alternative of analysis guide that is uh, provided as a guide, but strongly recommended that it is followed to the T uh, as the GIO has been involved in developing this. So we will be initiating that. Uh, we'll have an independent contractor. Uh, WRPS would be um, available to provide technical um, answers, but they uh, are would not be the um, uh, the, the person persons that would be conducting the AOA. Um, I, as the federal project director, I will be working and providing information to those selected committee members. Um, from the Department of Energy headquarters with recommendations um, from us as to who would be a, a, a good uh, company to bring in to do the independent analysis. Um, I, I guess uh, kind of in closing, that's a high level summary. I know Delmar can fill in the blanks or um, with other things, but I really wanted to take the opportunity to, to, to thank um, the Department of Ecology um, our other um, Department of Health and other agencies, including the Hanford Advisory Board, for your support of the uh, tank side season removal. 
Uh, it, it took a village to get this done. And again, I, I sincerely appreciate all of your help in getting us to where we are today. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate that. And again, if you have more questions, Tom, do you want to dive into WTP status at this point, or do you want me to try tank farms? Either way is fine with me. Why don't you go tank farms and I'll pick up. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Um, Ruth, how do you want to do the questions? This is going to be a conversation. So we probably should take questions during the presentation. Uh, so the easiest the easiest way to do it and what we found in the last in with Oregon Hanford cleanup board is people raise their hand. Um, and then when we get a speaker where we get a break and, and this would be a perfect one, if there's a break on what's been presented at this point in time, we can answer those questions and then continue the dialogue. Um, we have lots of data, um, but again, we can we this is this is really about meeting the needs of of ensuring information as a board. So go ahead, Bob. Let me let me insert just one little thing that we check in with Brian and Dan as well when we have these 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 breaks before questions, so that we we make it kind of a three way conversation, if you will. <laughs> Goe Ecology and the and the board. Um, well, good morning, everybody. This is Dan McDonald from Ecology. Um, I'm going to sit here quietly until Janet and Tom and Delmar are done, and then I'll have my say. But what I want everybody to recognize at this particular point is we are treating waste. <laughs> Keep that in mind as you continue to hear the rest of the commentary, and then uh, I'll weigh in at the appropriate time. Bob? Okay, thank you. Uh, Ruth, my chat is not working, so okay. I guess I'll have, I have to raise my hand. It, it just locked up on me. So um, I, I, I am very impressed, just like uh, Dan said, that we are treating waste. This is a major accomplishment. Um, but I, I was a little uh, confused uh, Janet said something about uh, five years for this Tisker approval. Uh, what is that? And does that does mean that we mean have to come up with a new Tisker in five years? Or, or uh, what is the impact of that? Thanks. Uh, great question. And uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so uh, Tisker is a subset of a much larger project. Um, it's a demonstration project. Um, uh, the first application at Hanford, and like we said, we're actually treating wastes. Uh, it is a five gallon per minute treatment capability, essentially. Um, so our plan is to start this to stage a million gallons in AP 106 to support Tom and his hot commissioning of the law of melters. But his treatment capability can basically treat about 10 gallons per minute equivalent uh, on a long-term basis. So for the long-term mission, uh, the the additional analysis that Janet's talking to, to the department is to evaluate our options based off the results of Tisker and based on the operational experiences we're seeing in this first half of this year and design a longer, per, more permanent treatment capability to support DF law uh, operations. Uh, working with the state and, and Dan's team, the Tisker unit includes some hose and hose application and is being done under a five year permit. Um, our plan would be to, you know, operate this um, facility, maintain the feed to support vitrifications and in parallel, adding more capabilities to support 100% uh, running capability of the law facilities. Uh, so that's that additional AOA and evaluation that's ongoing. Uh, we have to make the decision yet, uh, but it could be something like uh, two additional Tisker units. Um, and then again, you know, working with the state, uh, the the what unit that we have, <clears throat> there's you know options for operating it longer and putting hard hard pipe and pipe connections to that facility as well. So. Um, to let us get this in place and get started, 
Um, you know, there's some temporary aspects in terms of the hose and hose usage of this facility, and there's additional capability you'll need for the life cycle, and th that's what's being evaluated to be implemented. And again, uh, with the million gallons, we'll have many years uh, to put that in place and get that additional capabilities in place to maintain full treatment capability. Tom, anything you want to add from your perspective? No, Dumar, you hit it nail on the head. The other thing we all got to recognize is the waste treatment plant isn't going to start up at 10 gallons per minute either. So we've incorporated that or we've considered that as we look to how that ramp up happens, both on the waste treatment plant, um, as we all know that that will take uh, and projected to take a couple of years to get from initial startup to full production of 70% total operating efficiency, which equates to 21 metric tons of glass a day. Um, so just something to recognize as well. Steve Wigman, you're next. Wigman, you're next. Get off mute here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, always, always get real cheerful for this progress. I'm really delighted. Um, my, my, I have a couple of questions on the, the tank side cesium removal system. What, what all does that system remove from the stream? Is it just cesium? Right. Is it just cesium? Yeah, good question. Um, so I, I guess the first thing we start off with is we're just pulling supernate. You know, so this isn't isn't sludge uh, or a salt cake dilution. So it basically the treatment capability is filtration. So we're filtering out any of the solid particles within the liquid supernate and then running through an ion exchange that's removing the cesium. So you're, you're correct. It's fundamentally a cesium removal on a CST ion exchange media um, that's being captured and uh, is, is being changed out. So right now, operationally, we have uh, successfully ran the first uh, column units and are actually changing out the first two columns. Uh, the used columns are actually on the pad as we speak. And yesterday we were installing the replacement columns to resume operations. That's great, thank you. I, I, part of the reason I'm asking the question deals with the ultimate disposition of those canisters. Not that I need to comment on that right now. But I was also curious of the waste acceptance criteria for the uh, low-level treatment system in the VIT plant. Uh, what, just a general comment on what those criteria are for accepting feed. So, so I can I can take that one, Delmar. And the reality is, is the waste acceptance criteria is defined defined by an interface control document that both. Dumars contractor, my contractor, and both of us as feds all signed to align those. Uh, there are a couple couple key elements of of I'll say of <clears throat> limits. One of them is uh, cesium because we have categorized the activity waste as a HazCat three facility. So clearly we have a radiological limit control. Um, and then we way we test that or sample that is Delmar samples the samples it and then I confirm what Delmar sent me was what we received. So we control that that uh, TSR technical safety requirement um, through a sample regime that bat that double checks uh, each other's work. We always have the capability uh, should something have failed and create an off normal um, stream to send that back into the tank farm system um, and reject that batch to ensure we maintain the configuration of the DF law system as a whole, or DF law boundary, DF law boundary as, a boundary as a whole. One thing to note, uh, just so you're aware, is we also have in the unit itself, in the Tisker tank side seed removal system itself, real-time gamma monitoring that are constantly monitoring and confirming that the ion exchange is working as designed. And in fact, that's what we use to determine when we're getting breakthrough from the ion exchange columns and changing them out. The cycle is about 30 days of operations, about 200,000 gallons of waste treated for each uh, columns. We run three columns. Uh, we run two until we see indications. We put a polishing column on. Um, and then we change them out. The polishing column goes to the lead columns and we add two columns in. So that's essentially the cycle monitored with real time gamma monitoring on the treated side of the equation. And we'll do AP 106 sampling to confirm all this before it's sent to WTP. Thank you very much. 
Do we have Shelly? questions from folks who are new to to the tank committee and this? Um, I want to make sure that you have a chance to jump in and ask questions and not be bowled over by people who are really proficient in acronyms. Shelly? Yeah, we'll do our we'll do our best to not use them, but it's gonna we're gonna fail. <laughs> no, I, no, it's not like it's not a critique of you all. I just want to make sure that folks feel like they can jump in even if it feels a little new and um, uh, and not familiar yet. Shelly? And there is no silly question or question that you don't just don't understand. Just ask it. I think Shelly, you're I think next. Shelly, I don't see anybody raising still... their hand. Okay, I was just waiting. Hi to everybody. And uh, you know, there was a time, Tom. And it was a dollar per acronym. Uh, throw a buck on the table. So <laughs> when we get back in person, or this group gets back in person, uh, maybe we need to initiate that. So uh, the challenge becomes a little less for people, or at least a, 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 a slower slope. I one thing I didn't hear, and I'm curious about, is the loading on the ion exchange. And uh, before you had to change out the first two columns. And I'm, so was the loading, were those numbers uh, as anticipated? Um, great, great question. I don't know the specific numbers off the top of my head, but the performance of Tisker, uh, ion columns loading, uh, and throughputs and fl flow rates are exactly as designed, exactly as anticipated. <laughs> Uh, remember, this media has been used extensively in, in Fukushima and in Savannah River, so we had a lot of data on it, just not tank farms. And we had done uh, small-scale testing, and the full-scale operations is is consistent with the, the small-scale testing. So, you know, our initial breakthrough was uh, almost exactly as predicted. Um, the columns have significant more capability than this first batch used in terms of total uh, Curie content. And, uh, you know, we can get that data of exactly what was in those columns going forward. But again, this is the first batch through, so we're going slowly and cautiously and carefully, um, at least through this first cycle. So, Delmar, if I can, if I can add on to that then. So, um, Is it because you slowed down the system that you didn't get the loading that they're capable of? I mean, the processing or what, you know, what? Yep. This is, of course, the buildup of ion exchange problems at our site and, uh, and being able to uh, set up a system that's really efficient and and we don't garner a, a, such a huge waste stream down the road. So. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, no, and I, I kind of misstated it. We got the exact loading we were planning, so it performed okay. as expected. The this ion exchange media is a very, very proficient media, um, and but there's uh, you know radiation limits and process limits to because these are shielded containers uh, to manage within our safety basis perspectives. So uh, although the the media is very capable, um, there are other limitations. Uh, to how much we load it. So we're loading right at the the anticipated levels. Okay, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Liz. Thanks so much. Um, I had two questions. I have more than two, but I'll start with two. Um, one is just about schedule and timing. It, does everything, is everything on schedule so far or are there any concerns about schedule at this point? In total, in total at Tisker, we're at. Hey, help me out. In total, in getting law up and running, and um, so we're so we're a little behind schedule, but I would say there's no challenge to the regulatory or to our leg regulatory framework. Um, we did have some impacts as we've all talked, driven by COVID, and and those are being adjusted for from a regulatory standpoint. But as a whole, um, we're continuing to track good progress. We're working our way through Melter One heat up prereqs as we speak. Um, and shooting for a Melter 1 heat up later this summer. So uh, continue to make progress there. It, we're seeing a little more, I'll say, discovery of, of 
integrated operations as we go and do like water runs and the prerequisites to getting to melter heat up, but uh, nothing that is, I'll say, jumping out as alarming at this point in time. And let me add to that just uh, what Tom was talking about was within the WTP specific, his project, which my job is to keep him on critical path. Um, so I, I work hard to, to stay off that myself. Uh, uh, and obviously, Tisker, we're up and running, so we're well ahead of having a million gallons staged. Uh, and we can go in more details a little bit later in the conversations, but I have a very large suite of facility upgrades that we're finishing out uh, this year. So we'll be 100% ready for DF law operations on the tank farm side, as well as with the IDF and all the other infrastructure supporting WTP, uh, well ahead of his need date. So. Whenever he achieves hot commissioning, the balance of the site in tank farms and the other contractors will be ready. And we enjoy keeping him on the critical path. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the other question I had was about, and I don't know if this gets posted, is there characterization data from the feed tank for law that the waste that's gone through Tisker? Because that data somewhere is it part of I know Phoenix used to have a lot of tank waste information is that posted anywhere well Mara, best of my knowledge we haven't sampled AP6 yet that's correct so I mean we did detailed uh, analysis of our feed tank which is AP 107 so we have all that characterization data like I said we're doing real-time monitoring and all we're doing is filtering and the cesium removal essentially in tisker and so real-time monitoring the radiological content based on the high end exchange um, about two or three batches in we'll go in and do a confirmational sample of the treated waste in ap 106 to confirm and verify everything um, so that's uh, the next step we'll probably do that uh, two batches out so probably in about uh, 60 days we'll be doing that confirmational sampling in ap 106 uh, but they all the data from the pre-sampling indicates we're meeting or exceeding all of our actually exceeding all of our df expectations or decontamination how much season we're removing from the system um, by real-time monitoring so hopefully that answers the question can you just because i don't understand some like how how does that work to know so you're sampling before the cesium is removed. So how how do you know what? Anyway, how does that work to know what's been removed? Okay, good good question. If uh, let's see, look at the the diagram here. So in AP 107, we have uh, supernate staged to treat. So all the chemical compositions, uh, radiological content has been sampled as in that tank. So we you know the the chemical and radiological component on average. It goes into Tisker. Um, we do a filtration just to keep the solids from getting into the ion exchange, um, and then that's back flushed into the tank. Uh, so that's not really going anywhere. Uh, the treatment step in the tank side cesium is basically ion exchange, kind of like a water uh, uh, system in your facility, different ion exchange, but the same concept. So it flows through that, and we actually have a gamma monitor, a radiation monitor that can measure and confirm that the cesium has been removed just from a real-time measurement. In fact, we have two of them back to back that are tied to the control system. So that gives us a 100% positive verification that the cesium that we assumed has been removed uh, and can meet the acceptance criteria. Uh, so that's, that's how. So it's basically just you're looking, you're doing a, a reading of the radiation coming off the waste and then if it's not there after, you know it's gone, kind of. Correct, and then following that up with a, you know, sampling protocol, both on my side of the house, and then as Tom mentioned, he'll do his independent, not independent, but additional sampling to make sure that both parties, is, it's kind of like you're doing a record transfer from a, a treatment facility to a storage and disposal facility. It's a, a positive handoff on both sides. We do that internally as well. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And and when when you do the confirmation sampling, is that something you can make public or kind of maybe there's a email that can be sent to the board or just something to because it'll be a while till tank race meets again. Well, I mean that I, I'm assuming that all goes into the BBI system that is publicly available, I believe. Um, so it'd be just in that routine process. 
Uh, but we, we can definitely make sure we communicate when that sampling, confirmational sampling is done. Yeah. Thanks. And thank you for being here. This is really nice. Again, um, to piggyback on what Liz just said, thinking about what's available in Phoenix, I don't know that there is a, a field for like Tisker output BBI. So I'm not sure where I would find that information once it's there. You know, it doesn't seem to be very operations focused in Phoenix. Um, so if you when you figure out where you're going to be storing that information, could help us figure out what the right way is to make that retrievable, accessible. Um, you know, and it, it would just be helpful. Um, to, um, understand to understand what's back in there. Okay. Could, could we take one step back for our new folks? And Phoenix and BBI may sound like a, a bird and what it means. <laughs> all right. All right. So uh, if you are new, you should go check out phoenix.pnnl.gov because it has lots of fun visual toys that will tell you lots of really cool stuff about the Hanford site. There's a ton of data there. You can find out what exactly is in the tanks based on our best guess from the samples we've been able to collect. You can find where the groundwater plumes are. You can look at well data. I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff there. Um, and it's a really good public portal for data. So what I was asking for was, is there a specific window in that in public that portal, portal data? For data? data? to address this, this question of what's coming out the back end of that. Yep. I have the decoder ring. It's, it's on our picture here. AP 106. That is the tank that we're collecting that supernate in. Recognize there were some residuals in it, uh, but uh, as we, uh, so that residuals that you see in the current BBI isn't representative of what's the treated waste is, uh, but the that tank was uh, pumped out and, and cleaned appropriately to be the feed tank. So the next set of samples for AP 106 will be uh, representative of what's in that tank from the Tisker operations. Awesome. OK. And over the next five, 10 years of doing direct feed law, I assume 106 is going to be changing every time you swap it out. So you're going to have a new. I hope we're tr keeping track of those different slices of time since each one is going to be potentially pretty different. Absolutely, that's all controlled through the ICD and and confirmation that anything we send to the plant. I mean, there's lots of aspects, but ultimately it goes back to what Tom and the plant create as a formulation for his glass to ensure that the final product, i.e. the treated waste meets all performance parameters. And, cool. and let me point out here just for the rest of the audience, um, you see in the middle the purple, the WTB plant. Note that there is an analytical laboratory directly in the plant. That plant is designed to do all the Tom sampling work inside to do all of his confirmation. It's capable, what, of about 10,000 samples a year. In addition, on the tank farm side, we have the 222S analytical laboratory, which is shown here on the bottom uh, left of the picture. And that's the laboratory that I do, we use for the tank samples and all that data that you will find in the base, best basis inventory, BBI, uh, which is publicly available. Um, all of that data is, is on there. And like you said there, that shows the comp best knowledge of what the composition is and all kinds of constituents in each of the tanks. I don't think anyone has said yet. BBI is best basis inventory. BBI. Also known as a tongue tangler. Yeah. OK, um, let me jump in and, and kind of give you a little bit more perspective, uh, like we're talking about on, on tank farms and what we're doing to prepare for this and some other things. And uh, we'll take a pause after that, and then Tom can give you more details on WTP, and we can kind of go from there if that works for everybody. Um, obviously, this is an exciting period for us. Um, as, as Janet said, you know, coming out of COVID, uh, we're very focused on preparing for the direct feed low activity treatment. Uh, also, 
making sure that we're maintaining an eye on our safe tank storage, waste retrievals, and you know, preparing for future retrievals uh, and future treatments. So, for example, we were talking about the next phase of Tisker. We're planning and, and uh, executing those uh, preparatory actions as we speak. I mean, within six months of Tisker up and running, and we got the confirmation that it's physically working, we'll be doing our uh, alternative an analysis to basically create a project to add to our capability in the crawl, walk, run kind of scenario. Uh, question? Kelly. Yeah. Let's get you off the of mute. You're, you're on mute, Shelly. Yeah, our lip <laughs> reading isn't so good. Thank you. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to take this moment to say congratulations to Janet for the project. It's it's unbelievable, folks. This is really exciting time. Thank you so much. Well, and I appreciate that. And I know Jen and the team does, but I mean, be able to say that we brought in this under schedule, under cost across the complex. Um, I, Tom and I are both uh, gaining lots of support nationally because of that accomplishment that Janet and her team created. So I we agree wholeheartedly. Well, um, you know, Dan, I to say, share that with us as much as possible, because as we talk with with our legislators and folks, we can champion this. We can say we can, you know, state those numbers, get it out to the public. It's truly a, an amazing uh, accomplishment. Dan Solix. Yes, thank you. Good morning, and congratulations on the on the Tisker operation. I'm just curious: do your will your gamma monitoring give you a sense of how many carries is in a canister? Yeah, I mean we have direct ways to calculate exactly what the the canister did between the gamma monitoring and our real time uh, instrumentation. So yes, we do have that. I just don't know the number off the top of my head, is all. Okay, awesome. thank you. Is this the slide you need, Tom? Delmar, you're on mute this time. I, I'm sorry. We all fall into that trap, don't we? You know, to three years of doing this, you'd think you'd figure it out. <laughs> uh, so, so to kind of give you an update on the facility upgrades and improvements that we've been working on tank farms, again, to support hot commissioning. Uh, we've been doing lots of upgrades of, of different facilities. So uh, for that secondary off gas liquid stream that Tom was talking about on here on the bottom right side of the chart is a effluent treatment facility. So this treats that waste stream and there's a bunch of four basins that are called liquid effluent retention facilities. There are about six and a half million gallon basins that collect that liquid and then the effluent treatment facility treats that facility uh, that, that material to a clean wa drinking water standards, the water gets discharged in a permitted point, and then the solid materials as retrieved will go into the integrated disposal facility. That's where the glass is going as well. That's a permitted RICRA uh, disposal facility. We've been doing a lot of upgrades uh, for the last three years on these facilities. Uh, this year, we're finishing the upgrades of these facilities to be 100% ready to support hot commissioning. WTP will be producing a new waste stream that this facility hasn't treated before. So we're updating the systems. Mostly it's volume and reliability that we're focused on at this point. Uh, so this year's activities, you can see one of those liquid effluent treatment facilities, the one that's darker colored. Last year we replaced the cover. Uh, this year we're building a new one, that fourth one on the right side. Um, and I think there's a picture uh, on the next, the last slide, the third slide, one more. You can see at the liquid effluent retreatment facility, this uh, square here that looks like dirt, we're finishing that one out this year. What that gives us is the capacity to use two of these basins to support Tom and WTP operations, and the other two basins will continue to accept the other site-wide liquid. So this treats like water runoff, uh, the the, the liquid collected from the leachate fields of Erdoff and uh, the 242A evaporator uh, off gas. So 
Uh, those streams still continue. We'll keep them separated. And then the liquid attention facility is that facility you see above that in that picture. A lot of upgrades ongoing with that this year. Basically, we also did the first transfer from WTP to this facility a month ago as part of what Tom talked about is his uh, water run testing. So we've actually transferred liquid from waste treatment plant to the tank farms, i.e. water, but as part of our water runs and it was a major step forward. Um, we completed about a million gallons uh, campaign with the fluent treatment facility this year. And right now we're shutting that down and going into a uh, extended outage to finish all the physical upgrades and the systems in that that facility uh, improving power reliability uh, the treatment capability um, and adding some additional treatment capabilities required to support wtp both in volume and new uh, uh, treatment systems um, also we're upgrading the 242a evaporator that's down here on the bottom left um, we're replacing the lines from AW Farm to the evaporator. Uh, just to remind, those are double encased worker compliant lines and we had indications of uh, uh, damage on the outer pipe, not the inner pipe. Uh, so we've been out in an outage for the last year replacing those pipes. We'll complete those replacements, complete upgrades to the tank farm, or excuse me, the evaporator, uh, replacing pumps, uh, upgrading the safety systems and the control systems and going into an operational readiness review to begin evaporator operations later this year. That's critical for the whole system uh, to continue to make DST space available for retrievals. Um, also, uh, we're working upgrades in our laboratory, the 222S laboratory, which is way out in that west area in this picture. You can kind of see where it says 200 west area, way, way out there. That's where our laboratory is for the tank farms. Um, you know, it's things as simple as building office spaces. We have more people than we have chairs to sit in. And as we remobilize from COVID, uh, WRPS, we're building a whole new office facility out there, as well as ramping up for a much, much, much higher uh, loading of sampling just because of the level of activities that, that we're moving into. We're also uh, in the process of constructing uh, U-farm barriers. So out there in the west area, we've been working through a series of barriers. This is the fourth in that series. Uh, the first stage of construction that we completed this year uh, with a tramp, uh, the basin that evaporates it. I can't say the real word. Uh, and prepping for it with the final construction will be done the next year. Um, and that would put a barrier over the U-farm as part of our long-term uh, protection of the single shell tanks. On the retrieval front, I think everybody's well aware of, you know, we completed sea farm retrieval. We have completed three of the four tanks of AX farm. Uh, the third tank, we completed retrieval a few months ago. Again, we're still working with the state. We haven't declared uh, that we don't need to go in with more technology. So we're still all evaluating that. But the initial physical retrieval of the third of four tanks is complete. Right now we're monitoring it and we'll be sampling it and trying to determine the residual volume in those takes. So that only leaves AX104, uh, which we'll start retrieving of that uh, probably early fiscal year 23, which means you know September, October. Um, uh, and that would be the last of the AX farm. So at that point we have two farms fully retrieved, C and AX, and we are also in parallel working in a farm and you can see that in this picture here in the east area to doing all the preps so we can begin retrievals of a farm right after we finish the ax farm uh, it takes three to five years of extensive work to put in the water and the power and all the supplies into those farms to be able to retrieve them and those activities have been ongoing for a significant period of time was there a question I thought I saw Steve Anderson's hand. Steve Anderson? Maybe it went down. Steve Wigman and Jeff Lyon. Steve. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, you're covering a lot of stuff. This is really great. Uh, I have a 
question you may or may not be able to deal with yet, and that is the actual closure of tank farms. Um, I had many years ago thought that we would proceed into closure once we got them empty. So I'm curious, is there anything to be said about progress toward actually closing the farms? You're on mute again, Delmar. OK, there. God. Um, you know, there's lots of discussions about how we go forward and what our risk based priorities are going forward. Um, I would love to step into closure uh, activities. You know, really the question, Steve, that we're grappling with and we're working with the Department of Ecology as well. You know, it's, it's a discussion point within all of our, our discussions is how do we use the resources we have today to maximize the, the impact to the environment in the positive perspective? Um, and, you know, so part of what we needed to, to get into dialogue and come into alignment over time is, you know, the closure steps and when we do those, I mean, sea farm grouting, for example, just the physical aspects, if you were to do that again, assuming that we had a permit and we were going in landfill closure, which isn't decided yet, you know, that's a couple hundred million dollar activity. And that's competing, you know, directly against getting the <clears throat> tank waste empty and getting the treatment system up and operating. So we are in active discussions on the closure and the timing of the closure. But, you know, quite frankly, other than making sure they're safe, um, you know, don't present a hazard. Um, I think from a risk reduction perspective, getting our treatment system up and running and, and removing the waste from the environment, you know, may be a, a higher priority in the near term. Ongoing discussion uh, in terms of when that happens in the, the life cycle of the closure plans. Tom, anything from your perspective on that? Other than addition. Yeah. Yeah. So well, ongoing discussion on the timelines of those actively as we talk. That helps a lot, thanks. Jeff Lyon. Thank you. Um, I just had a question for Delmar regarding the infrastructure that he was talking about for a farm. Um, my, I'm not as intimately attached to the stuff because of all the other stuff I'm doing, but on a farm, have you installed the infrastructure yet? I thought you had. And so just could you clarify that? Yeah, we, we have been working it. Uh, good question, Jeff. And we've been working on adding the infrastructure in a farm, as you, you correctly identified, for several years. We are not totally done, so those activities are ongoing. Uh, cleaning out pits, they're actually uh, beginning to install the retrieval equipment in the pits for the first uh, tank. Um, and I'm trying to remember which one it is. I think it's 101, but I'd have to double check. Um, so, yeah. Uh, a lot has been done, but they are still working to do the equipment installation and preparations for initiation of the retrievals in a farm. But a lot of the electrical and infrastructure, you know, ventilation systems and stuff have already put in, putting in and we're really finishing that up because, like I said, we'll be stepping into AX 104 uh, at the end of this calendar year. So when that's done, the next step is a farm. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that means uh, that that two to five year or three to five year, whatever that example is, is is a little bit shorter. But you still have crew issues. I know with moving crews between a farm and AX farm. So, thank you. That does answer my question for me, anyway. Any others while we're in a pause here? I don't see any hands right now. OK, uh, let's see. I don't want to take all of Tom's time either. Let me just kind of touch base on a few things quickly and then I'll hand it over to Tom and we can discuss from there. Um, so. Sorry, was there a question? I was just getting a feedback. OK, um, so in addition to all these activities and most of what I talk about so far is really targeted to two things. One, startup of DF law hot commissioning, and then two, once we start up ensuring our facilities are reliable because we don't want to start up this machine and not be able to treat waste because uh, once the melters are started, they're started and, and Tom has to keep them energized. Uh, so we want to use the asset as much and 
as quickly as it will physically support. Uh, we continue safe tank waste storage activities with DST integrity programs, inspections, UT work bringing in uh, new inspection technologies, working with a lot of uh, a lot of universities and stuff. And it's amazing what small robotics that we can get into the two by two air slots under the tanks and do UT work. Um, also continuing SST integrity program, visual inspections, dome surveys, uh, working with a structural integrity panel. Um, we're also working um, uh, a test bed initiative, phase two, which is a 2000 gallon uh, demonstration of uh, a treatment from SY farm uh, to a grout form to an offsite disposal again as a, as a treatment demonstration from the regulatory process perspective mostly. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to really throw out there is just a, a reminder that uh, we are uh, in the process of an acquisition process. Uh, so our 222S contractor, we changed out in April to HLMI, which is Hanford Laboratory Management Integrated, I think. Uh, they're doing great. Uh, they've stepped in and doing a, a good job. Uh, no disruption in service and support to the site. Uh, the WRPS contract, I think everybody is aware that that's been extended uh, for another two years through the end of 23. And there is an ongoing procurement process for, it's called the integrated tank disposition contract. There is a request for proposal, which is the document that went out to industry asking for proposals. Uh, and if you're interested, that's available online. Uh, it's in the active process of procurement, so I really can't say anything about it, even if I knew a lot about it, which I don't. Um, but sometime after that award, we'll be going into a transition process that will pick up the tank farm contract scope at some point in the future. And also it will pick up the WTP operations post Bechtel's hot commissioning period. So that would be the, the long-term operator for the full suite of DF law facilities, except for those that are supported, you know, on the other prime contractors. And in a barring questions or additional dive ins, I would hand it over to Tom to give you a more detailed rundown of, of his exciting activities. I mean, just as a ex deputy FPD for this project, you really need to get out there and look at it. It is exciting. And I could use other words of the progress that's been made. And this is an operating facility and and getting this thing up and operated is well within our collective reach. Oh, Suyama. Yeah, um, Dalmar, you, you mentioned the uh, TBI. I, I was just wondering, We the last time we heard about it, it was in the WEIR process. So what's the status and what's what can we expect next on the uh, TBI and when? Okay, good, good question. So um, we have the full funding for the demonstration. As you correctly identified, we are in the WEIR process. Um, we had the public meeting and we're doing the NRC consultation step. So we're, we'll be expecting sometime mid this year to get feedback from that process, uh, which I believe there's some public meetings in that process as well. Uh, so we'll continue through that process uh, to get a weird again. This is only for a 2000 gallon demonstration. Um, after we get that, we would do again the NEPA documentation, which is required again for a small scale demonstration. Um, and then uh, once we complete that and made that decision within the department, you know, resubmit the, the permit and work with the state to pre present or uh, to permit that operation. The installation is simple, and what we're talking about is you know a week, kind of one week worth of operations of that actual uh, retrieval and and treatment capability. Again, just for the rest of the audience, what this is is a, a demonstration of all the regulatory processes to be able to successfully treat, go through the weir process and the NEPA process, uh, grout offsite, uh, meet all the requirements, and dispose of an offsite commercial facility uh, as a as a demonstration project 
uh, and to work through all the, the regulatory processes with uh, our state and, and all the associated uh, players in that equation. Thank you. Okay, any more questions for Delmar before I jump in and do a little bit of WTP and and then close out with just any any other questions that you all have curiosities on? Go for it, Tom. Okay, hearing none. So a lot of progress. Delmar uh, stated it correctly. A lot of excitement, and this picture does not do it justice. Um, the real change that has been made on this plant over the last three, two years, three years. Um, the facility truly looks and is starting to feel um, like an operating facility. Anybody that's actually worked in a petrochemical or chemical industry or even out at Hanford, um, when you get to a two operating facility, all of the the road, the, the actual infrastructure, the way people are dressed, that change is starting to occur. Um, the construction attire that once was the pre uh, prevalent is now gone to more of the operations attire, which looks a lot more like street clothes. Um, so the culture itself is making that shift from what has been a construction culture of 20 plus years to get us to where we are to an operations culture. And and I will, I will make the analogy that uh, we've been on a long journey traveling from the uh, coast of California to the foothills of uh, Mount Whitney, um, and we're starting up the hill. Um, and that hills, that hill and that last, that last climb, while not as long, is equally as hard, if not harder, um, as we move forward. And the reason I say that is we're now going through the integrated testing. Delmar talked a little bit about water runs. Um, so we've done all the SIS startup testing we've turned and those are basically test individual components to ensure that when it when it's actually activated or changed, we see that change in the control room. Uh, we've gone through all that testing that was completed in the October time frame and really culminated in our loss of power test, which showed did the facility respond as expected to a loss of power? And really what that's all about is one, does it respond? i.e. the fans continue to run, stops feeding through the melt, the, the pumps to ensure that the cold cap burns off and then you're in a stable standpoint. And then two, can we recover from that loss of power? Um, because power is the lifeblood to the melters. Um, it is what keeps the melter in a molten form. And if a melter goes to a, to a glass form, um, you have got a large 300 ton paperweight. Um, and that is exactly what we do not want. So can we recover out of that loss of power? The test went very well. Matter of fact, we had less. We did have a couple uh, issues, I will call them, but they're relatively minor and have all been worked through. Um, we also have uh, gone through and started what we call our commissioning testing. Our commissioning testing starts with water. Can we move water around the plant as expected? Um, we started with the effluent management facility and successfully completed that in the October timeframe. And we've been actually operating those systems for operator proficiency uh, when we can. Um, clearly, operators have, are getting experience in a multitude of in a multitude of areas. The analytical lab is in a very similar configuration. Where, if you recall, we did a lot of our analytical uh, analyte development and analytical method development down at CBC. Um, and have now moved all that equipment out to the laboratory where the chemists and chem techs are actually going through their proficiency testing um, and showing that yes, they can actually do the work. And then here in the very not too or in the not too distant future, we'll be into open source uh, methods validation um, with actual radiological uh, sources, known sources um, to actually process through the system. And then the, the majority of the work as we look to the future is really in the integrated operations and the commissioning of the low activity waste facility. Uh, we just completed the water runs within the low activity waste facility for both Melter 1 and Melter 2. Um, we're finalizing the water run or the water uh, movement there. And really that's testing as we receive water from tank farms and we're simulating it coming from tank farms. 
Um, can we measure and transport the water through all of the different vessels and all of the different configurations? Because there's cross connects between the vessels as well as between the actual melters. Um, so we can feed melter two from melter one supply and vice versa. So we've gone through that. And while there were issues in going through that and we had some learning, um, those learning evolutions are being applied to future instrumentation. And most of this learning is in instrumentation calibration and communication. Um, this is an automated plant, um, something very different from what we were used to or what we have traditionally been used to on the Hanford site um, when we shut down in, in 89, which was much more of an analog st structure. Um, you were used to going and reading a gauge and writing it down on a piece of paper and turning a knob or a dial uh, to change a parameter where this plant is all ran out of the control room um, and is all done through interlocks and communication electronically. So a lot of those challenges have been in making sure that those communications, the level indication, the radar sensors, all those are working as planned. We're working our way through those and got the vast majority of those done. There's a couple of remaining items to go, and then that will get us into uh, prerequisites complete for melt their heat up. Um, where the last couple of things that we're working our way through is the plant cooling water. Uh, we did have a premature failure on the pump, a couple of the pumps there, and we put together a team to ensure we understand the root cause of that. Uh, and then going and putting fixes in place prior to melt their heat up. Um, and, and, and obsolescence in general is something that we're watching very closely. Uh, we don't believe this to be truly, op, truly, um, I'll say obsolescence in terms, but it's a definitely a making sure that as we look to the equipment that in many cases have been staged and in service for 10 plus years, um, we got to make sure that those are all ready. So we're taking a second look across the ranch to ensure that the operational components that aren't driven, I'll say directly by the low activity waste facility, but are our support systems, um, chilled water, steam, um, I, uh, the re treated water, deionized water, plant service air, all those systems also operationally are ready to support uh, the low activity waste facility as we move into heating up the melter. Because as Delmar said, once we commit a melter, once we've heated it up, added the glass formers, turned that molten pool, turned that glass former into a molten form, there is no returning to a non-heated melter. Um, it is a asset commitment at that point in time, and we've got to then move forward into op, into a I'll say the cold commissioning aspects of it, um, and then forward into hot commissioning aspects of it. And I know I've went through a lot there, so I'll pause. Um, and answer some questions, and then I can continue on into kind of the next steps of where we're going. Shelly, I think I saw your hand up first. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, for this presentation. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot, given that, you know, we've got Russia on the warpath and, uh, and we're seeing a uh, tremendous rise in, uh, in, uh, uh, the costs of everything and, uh, and availability. I'm thinking about materials and I'm thinking about the international market and I'm wondering how that applies to uh, replacement of uh, equipment, the building of pieces that are one of a kinds and uh, ability to get the steel and, and anticipate uh, those difficulties as we move into operations at this site for for the you know for the WTP and bigger projects and what are you guys thinking about in terms of uh, in terms of that? So Shelly, you're you're dead on. One of the one of the lucky parts of being part of this project is we actually started thinking about that four years ago, or basically four years, four or five years ago, um, and started procuring a lot of those those critical spare parts. Um, and not only have we procured critical spare parts for cold commissioning and, and hot commissioning, we've co procured a number of those spare parts or in the process of procuring those spare parts prior to either the pandemic setting in and or um, the the global crisis of, of the war we're seeing with Russia and Ukraine. Um, so luckily, a lot of that, at least in the near term, we have captured. We are going back and looking at those critical spare parts and the time frame delivery or the current status of the market to ensure that there are not things that even though we have spare parts in place and available 
we shouldn't order more knowing that 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 duration to receipt is much longer um, and and this isn't this isn't localized the WTP or or ORP or Hanford. This is something oh, no. we are all looking at across the site. I know IWTU has experienced similar uh, instances, and we're looking at this for glass formers all across the board. We're looking at our single point um, supply chain and making mm -hmm. sure that we have either redundancy or a strong contract and delivery mechanism and, and potentially multiple delivery mechanisms in place to support the continued operation. Um, because none of us want a facility that's ready to operate or able to operate, but unable to actually operate driven by commodity uh, or spare part. So I will say a lot of Shelley, a lot of energy has gone into that and we're actually doubling, I'll say going back and reevaluating those items that we didn't declare as critical, but as just spare parts, a lot of a lot of standard commodities, valves, hosing, um, gasket material is now becoming more challenging um, in the current environment. So we're going back and looking at that that bigger picture given the current environment to ensure that we can, once we start this plant, operate it long term. We have nothing identified today that stops that, um, but we're continuing to look. The arrow area is, is INC. Uh, instrument and control, um, mm -hmm. computer chip, uh, silicon uh, chips are becoming challenging in a lot of ways. So we're looking at all of those those changes of the global market and how that affects us from an operation standpoint. The reality is it's going to cost us more, and 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 we got to plan for that. Um, I think we all felt the inflation this last year in many ways. Uh, I think I th saw the number, the re most recent number was an 8% inflation last year. And most of yeah. us plan for a two to two and a half percent from a come from a construction standpoint, a two to three percent inflation. So we're just watching that and, and affecting influencing it the much we can. Well, I really appreciate that you guys in initiated this look at redundancy and ability to, to reach things, especially off the shelf. Yeah. I mean, that's as important as one of a kind. So, you know, we've got tool and die guys that could build something if we needed to. I know this site does. And if not, then there is within, you know, the the programmatic picture. But uh, but the off the shelf stuff is just as important. And uh, and I really appreciate that you've, you know, started that look four years ago, but now it feels even more uh, pressing. So thanks for that. I, I appreciate what you said. Bob, and yes. going, we're we're into break time. We can we can shuffle a little bit. Um, Bob? Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh no, no. I'm I wrong. I show ten forty five for break. No, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wrong meeting agenda. Say, uh, Shelley raised the issue of the uh, situation we're in with Russia now. I, I know that uh, they have threatened. Uh, taking actions to like take down the grid um, since power is the key thing for the melder what have you guys uh, taken actions to ensure that we are able to respond if something like that were to happen hey tell me we start with that and because i mean there's the generic question um because that is a threat and it's really a, a larger cybersecurity threat uh, so, as a member of the federal government, we have been seeing a dramatic escalation of the requirements that both Tom and I have to meet for all of our operational and control systems. So, they are changing faster than we can keep up with it, which is a challenge. Uh, it is driving some, some real challenges as well. Uh, I and mean, that's more of a global perspective. Uh, Tom, maybe you can add some more specifically from a the power perspective. Yeah, a couple of things, Bob, there. And, and, and Dunmar's exactly right. Cybersecurity is an ever changing animal that we all are trying to keep up with. Um, we do have, we are doing our best to isolate ourselves from um, that event through the control systems we have in place and the cybersecurity measures that support them. Um, the reality is, is there's no 100% answer to that. What I will tell you, though, is we did do an evaluation um, from a WTP standpoint, looking at can we 
um, support a long-term outage, not necessarily driven by uh, a cybersecurity event that takes down the grid, but driven by the challenge of getting um, our substation, should we have an outage in our own substation, A6, which is where the two redundant sources of power for WTP, the North Loop and South Loop, come into. Um, but ultimately, if we're down there for some event, um, can we can we recover or maintain Melter operations? And what, what we've done from a in, from a review is that we can shed loads and use our diesel generator through cycling to extend the operation of the melters while not originally designed, but extend the operation of the melters for a pretty significant period of time. It's not an easy process. Um, we will have an abnormal operating procedure that supports that, but it's not something we intend or want to do. Um, but we did do that evaluation because we were concerned, um, not necessarily from, a, like I said, from a cybersecurity event, but really from, well, yes, we do have two lines coming into the into A6 substation. A6 substation is still one substation. So if you were to have a fire in the substation, um, you have a challenge there. Um, so when we looked at that from a risk-based perspective, uh, since I've got here, we did do that evaluation. And uh, good news is we do have the support from, an, from the diesel generator. Requirement then becomes diesel supply, which we have a pretty good, we have a really good uh, contracts in place to support both the um, steam plant as well as the diesel generator should that be needed. Thank you. Hey, Tommy, you might sorry, point out the fact that in addition to that, although slightly different angle is on the infrastructure perspective and its importance, we're doing major upgrades to your feed lines. Correct. Yeah, the, there's a major project I think everybody knows, and, and it's not a direct requirement for DF law, but the North Loop replacement line that's planned to go in in 2025 uh, will replace the 19, I think it's 40s vintage current line that has reduced capacity um, and reduced reliability. Um, so that's another piece of of that, that review to make sure that uh, as we are in a slightly degraded condition, as compared to where we would like to be, because originally we had hoped that that north line would be replaced in 2023, and it has to be tied in. So just so everybody's clear, that line has to coincide with a uh, Northwest Energy outage, um, because we have to actually tie into their grid at their facility. Um, so that outage has to occur, and it only occurs roughly every two years. So we are currently tied in with BPA. BPA is doing that design and tied in with the energy um, Energy Northwest to do that that tie-in in 2025. I've got folks in queue. I've got Liz, Pam, and Jerry. Liz? Thanks. Um, I had two questions. Um, one was just, if if the melter goes out, what, it, I guess, is there a way if you knew you were going to lose power to empty it or like how does that how, or just like once the glass is in it it's just in like so, no going back like so, what's that yeah is there so a there's nothing so if, if you're to lose if we if we get a melter full there's no there's no turning around from our reuse so once once it's full of glass it has to be maintained hot in a molten form um, and we, that's not a problem from an operational standpoint. You can idle a melter, i.e. we're not adding significant quantities or no waste. Um, we do have means to add chemistry adjustment and maintain volume um, in an off-normal continuing or extended standby condition. So we have the ability to manage it for an extended period of time, but you, there's no way if you were to lose power and you're not able to restore power to the melter and it loses, I've talked about this before, a melter in our melters are essentially the glass is the element. So if you think of a induction oven where the pan is the element, you take the pan off, you've got no heating, the glass is that. And when the glass is in a molten form, it has resistivity, which creates the heating. If the glass goes to a solid form, the resistivity goes to zero and you have no heating. So that's the driver. So the glass becomes the actual element. We pass current through that glass, the resistance in the glass creates heat, and that's what keeps it molten. So the goal here or the requirement is to do that. From a disposal standpoint, if that's where you're going with this, there's not a huge impact. We would add as, as much as we're able. We would try to 
add as much of raw glass formers, limited waste to into that to get it to, I'll say the least amount of, of remaining waste. But remember, all the waste will still be in a glass form. And that those those all get disposed of in our current IDF landfill. Uh, we would go through a process to bring them up to 90%, re remove all free liquids as much as physically possible, and then fill the void up to the 90% requirement within the landfill. And then those would get transported just like any other canister of glass over to the landfill for disposal um, in, in, in IDF. So that's the structure. We do assume, so just so everybody's clear, we do assume those are consumable products. We currently assume a five-year change out. Um, we have two melters, two spare melters currently in development. Melter three will be delivered uh, here in the not too distant future and melter four is also procured. Um, so those melters are being procured and will be assembled right here in downtown. Well, I just I should say in North Richland um, at the Atkins WSU building. Um, and then they'll be transported out onto site for ultimately being put in onto the onto the transport rails and then pulled into the low activity waste facility when that change out happens. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, and, and just one overarching statement. Thank you so much for this style of presentation today. We've been like so hungry for this and it's so satisfying to have a conversation and dialogue like hallelujah. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question I have is about mass balance. Um, I, we've been asking and for, and it's, I don't understand the technical document super well, but just a dot like one document that um, details all the like, here's all the waste we have. This is where everything goes. We know where everything is, is my understanding of mass balance. Like, you know where everything is at any one point in time. Um, recently, we were alerted to the acetonitrile issue where, as I understand it, cyanide in the waste, when it goes into the melter, becomes methyl cyanide, which is acetonitrile, yeah. and it's above um, worker health and safety exposure limits, and it's also above land disposal restriction limits. Um, and it would go be captured in the secondary waste stream and be something that's dealt with at the effluent treatment facility. Um, and that kind of flagged, it seemed like a, a oop, like a, whoa, we didn't really anticipate that issue and made me wonder well, what other issues might be like that. Um, so kind of a two part question, is there a mass balance document kind of being created and updated um, as these new issues come up? And then um, can you talk at all about the acetonitrile issue? Yeah, so acetonitrile is not not new. So let's be very clear on that. It's always assumed that we were going to have acetonitrile in the system. It's created from the incomplete combustion of the of the addition of sugar in high organic waste streams. Um, so we always assume that, and and that's why it was a part of the waste acceptance criteria going down to the effluent treatment facility um, originally. So. One of the things that we we did and and to ensure that we can actually treat that in alignment with the requirements for disposal was Delmar looked at that limit and then how do we actually treat it um, to meet land disposal requirements um, and and the choose choice there was through air stripping um, and then ultimately grouting or or solidifying. So the other thing that we're doing simultaneously is looking at, and we've had done a small review or did a review with the scientists at PNNL to look at, well, in those in those waste streams that challenge or at least produce the more significant components of acetonitrile, can we actually eliminate uh, the sugar component and therefore reduce the production of acetonitrile from an operational standpoint, not just the treatment side of the house, um, because that's always the preferred option is eliminate. Um, and we are doing, we've done an initial about six month look at that. And it's very positive that in the event that we, and again, there's more work to be done here because you got to show the glass is still um, in the best, in a, in a robust form, I guess is the way I'll put it, meeting the glass specification requirements. But the initial look is that, that it would, and there is capability downstream, not in the initial startup, but downstream, um, that we may be able to reduce the sugar or eliminate the sugar from those batches we have concern of going forward. So um, I think that's that's the area that we're, area that we're currently we're in. And Delmar, if you want to add specifics to the ETF project, feel go ahead. 
OK, so yeah, I'd love to and appreciate the question. Um, and as like Tom said, uh, we've been looking at this a long time. Um, that the review and the concerns were really based off of uh, some data in very early in the design of the treatment system. So since that point, we have you know completed the design and the health and safety evaluations. Uh, one of the upgrades that we're working in the affluent treatment facility is that affluent uh, in the ETF, the liquid affluent retention, excuse me, the affluent treatment facility is uh, that steam stripper, which is one of the upgrades that we're installing. Um, it is designed to safely uh, remove that from the waste stream to ETF from WTP. And again, uh, as Tom reduces the inventory, then you know that wouldn't be needed to do as much. Um, the chemical is in the liquids, but it's immiscible in liquid, i.e. it isn't uh, uh, available in terms of the hazard. It's primarily an inhalation hazard. Um, it is treated and removed uh, that material is not LDR, I mean, is LDR compliant and, and can be treated and disposed into the integrated disposal facility. That design and uh, installation is occurring in the ETF as we speak, um, and it basically is designed with a zero exposure element to the workers during all phases of operation, as well as we have and will incorporate the appropriate industrial hygiene controls and monitoring in the facility as well. The key is that this form is not in the facility at this point, and this is a new element that would be introduced with the WTB hot commissioning. Uh, so the acetyl nitrate is not in any existing of the streams that has ever been in the fluent treatment facility or the retention ponds. And it's a, like uh, Tom said, it's a direct result of the incomplete combustion of the sugars that are added as part of the glass formulation. And uh, we now can I'm sit down you. and. Uh, now I'm sorry. You. And, and Liz, to answer your question on uh, mass balance, we do maintain mass balance. One of the, and I've said this all along, um, it's all theoretical at this point in time. We have to get into operation to truly understand exactly how the decontamination factors, and Delmar talked a little bit about this on your question you had a little while ago, specific to the ion exchange columns and Tisker, but we assume decontamination factors based on based on uh, the mathematical calculations or the design of the system for every unit operation within the waste treatment plant, and that unit operation and decontamination factor then derive the uh, split to where that fraction of whatever chemical you're looking at goes. Ultimately, what we manage to is our interface control documents to define the envelope in which we are going to going to operate and manage to um, to support the the long term operation. So the uh, effluent treatment facility WAC defines what we that we WTP can actually send and leave the. WTP proper site down to the effluent tension effluent liquid effluent retention <laughs> facility and ultimately treated through the effluent treatment facility acronym where I'd rather use acronyms here but effluent treatment facility uh, for ultimate uh, disposal um, in the appropriate configuration and alignment with uh, regulatory standards. We're so well trained we can't even say the real names, so we apologize for struggling with the, the full titles. I have Pam and Jerry, and we'll take a break at 10.45. Pam? Thank you. Um, I, I just want to add my voice to everyone else um, to say thank you for your incredible work, um, particularly during the last two years. Um, the presentation today was so encouraging, and um, um, thank you. Um, hope it goes well. Take care. Jerry. Um, uh, going back to diesel generators, it seems like quite a part of the conversation ago. Um, uh, I was surprised when I saw the total carbon emission annual data um, expectation for the vitrification plant. Um, 
Uh, do the diesel generators, are they operational a large portion of the time, even when you're not using them for actual backup generation? No, Jerry, the, the carbon emission for WTP comes from steam. So the biggest portion of carbon generation for WTP comes from the diesel fired boilers that support the steam of the entirety of the plant. There is uh, there is a data set out there that shows the entirety of WTP as originally designed um, from a carbon emissions as compared to just the DF law configuration. So I don't know which data source you're looking at, but the DF law configuration, as you would imagine, is significantly lower than WTP in total, but it is not zero by any way, shape or form. Um, we do have a pretty significant carbon generation driven by the facility uh, and the design that's been there for and been being built for 20 years. Okay, so it's the diesel steam generator, not backup. Okay, thank you. And steam's required for everything. Steam goes down, the plant goes down. What other questions do you have? Steve Wigman. Yeah, thank you. Um, as I look in your faces, I think of assets and um, you folks are obviously a tremendous asset to this project. And I'm just want to, I just wanted to mention that I'm hoping you got good backup for as you evolve in your life forms so that we don't lose your brains. Yes, Steve, I mean, I, speaking for, for my group, and again, I've been in, in the tank farms again for about the last year, year and a half, um, and it's exciting time to be in here uh, from when we were in, in the 2000s. Uh, but uh, I'm a, I actually impressed with some of the young leaders that we have within our organization. I know I personally have uh, two division directors that are far more skilled and technically advanced and politically aware than I ever was. So actually, I'm, I'm quite encouraged with what we have. Um, we don't have enough. Uh, we never have enough. I mean, our contractors are going to struggle with that as well, of getting the talent that we need to operate this plant. I mean, you know, essentially WTP operations is, you know, nominally a thousand people of highly skilled, highly trained, you know, permanent, substantial opportunities for employment. Um, and I mean, I think there's some exciting opportunities. We've been out, you know, doing fairs and stuff to try to develop uh, an appetite for young workers to come, not only to the department, but for all of our contractors. And, uh, you know, we had a very, very high turnout. So, I mean, there's some huge challenges, but there's some also huge opportunities. And, and, and I guess speaking for myself, you know, I want to, in the next few years, get us in a position that, you know, we can hand them off a the beginnings of an operating treatments facility that they can grow to get this job done. Um, hopefully, well, I'm still around, but uh, if not, shortly thereafter. Tom, you want to add on that? No, and, and I appreciate it, Steve. We we completely agree. I'm my goal is to work myself out of a job and turn it over to the next generation as well, because uh, ultimately. Uh, we will we will transition to new roles as we complete this, but uh, you are absolutely correct. Making sure that pipeline, and I would agree with Delmar, there are some bright candidates. They've not not saying they're ready today or tomorrow, but we as a team are working hard to ensure through our training programs, through our leadership development tr uh, courses, trying to make sure that 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 capability exists as as we at some point in time transition out of our current roles. Thank you. We're we're all reliant on you. <laughs> Hang in there. Dan Solitz. Yes, I have two questions. One has to do with the IDF. Are you uh, considering how you're going to load that, and are you going to uh, keep the uh, grout, grouted waste separate, the grouted solid secondary waste separated from the from the glass, uh, so that you don't co-mingle that? And the other question is, how is it going with the new contract form, the ID? indefinite quantity, indefinite quality. How is that working out for, for the work you've done so far on the, the, uh, the law? So 
So I'll, I'll speak at a macro level. I don't know exactly how they will stage the or how they will um, handle the secondary waste versus the primary glass form. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a permitted facility and will align with the permitted requirements. I know the facility is planning to operate in a batch capability, so we would transfer waste from WTP over to the facility and they would get a certain quantity of glass logs and or secondary waste present and then batch that in down into the actual facility for treatment or for disposal um, so that you're trying not to do a single log and so they'll they'll man they'll optimize operations between the F the ERDF facility and the IDF facility because both those facilities will be uh, operated and managed by uh, CPC Co um and the crew that supports ERDIP would also support idf so that that operation will be optimized between those two to support uh ongoing disposal for wtp and then for the for the other one i don't have i personally don't i mean i don't have any direct knowledge of it i can't answer that question for you dan dan and, and dan on that one were you you talking about the idtc contract that cpc co has because that's the one of the early ones that is on site the future tank farm and df law operations contract is is the one that i spoke of earlier that's that's actually in the procurement cycle as we speak thank you thank you Last questions. I don't have anybody in queue. Nothing being wrong two minutes ahead of schedule. That's a good project management work. Okay. <laughs> that or dumb luck. Well, thank you guys for the time and the opportunity to have this conversation and, and, and share some of the exciting things that we're doing. You know, we all acknowledge that we have huge challenges going forward and I think you know we talked about it a little bit. There's a lot of priorities. There's a lot of risks to deal with, um, and we've got to make some intelligent decisions on how we prioritize that and how we approach the mission. Uh, but getting a treatment capability up positions us to move forward. And as we said, we are treating waste for the first time for the sole purpose of final treatment and disposal. And we can see in the very close future that we'll be operating and and treating waste, removing the supernate, which is the most mobile component. And we have 19 million gallons that we pulled out of the single shell tanks sitting in the double shell tanks. And really that's the highest risk and the most mobile form of the tank waste that we have on hand. It may not have the highest individual composition, but it's clearly the most mobile. And 19.5 million gallons staged uh, will get us a long ways down the path. Hey, Delmar. I, I you might want to go back to Dan McDonald just to say any closing words since he didn't really get to speak. Good. Dan? Well, thank you, folks. What I would offer at this point is that Ecology stands ready to continue the relationships and the partnerships towards successful uh, starting optimization and continuing this project at large. There's a lot more to be said, but we're out of time, so we can discuss things later. But Yay, good on you guys. Let's keep it up. Right. So Thanks, I'm going to give, give you something to think about over the break because we're going to come back at 11 a.m. in spite of the typo on the agenda. We'll come back at 11. And we're going to talk about system planning. And the goal of the system planning agenda item is to come up with a brainstormed list of things that you as CAB members want DOE and Ecology to consider as they're creating scenarios for System Plan 10. So we're gonna do a brainstorming at the end of that discussion. Um, so that's the product for that item. And we'll say more about it after break. Bob? Yes, and I, I really wanted to thank Tom and Delmar and Janet for, for this discussion. This is something that I, I thought we got more out of than a standard presentation. We were able to ask our questions and, and get a lot of our concerns answered. And with that, I'd like to ask, when can we do this again? Um, 
what would be a good time to to reschedule another conversation uh, after the matters have started up? Uh, looking at your calendars uh, a year from now, something like that, or or what? I can speak. I can speak for D, for DF Law at a macro level. I would say probably a six month interval would probably make probably pretty good sense. Okay. Um, we should be able to have enough enough change. It may not be huge change, but enough change to at least have some level of discussion, and then we can clearly adjust the time frame in which that discussion takes to address the amount of change we've had. Sounds good. Okay, I have put you on my list. Thank you. I hope it's a good list. <laughs> right. Let's come back at 11 a.m. Talk to some point. So, let me set this the stage here and we've got Jim Lynch um with us as well um used to be our ddfo so he knows a little bit about that um the point here for this agenda item are are two pieces one is to give you sort of an orientation to what system planning is and the second part is to actually get brainstormed input from the group here we're not talking about consensus we're not talking about refined we're talking about brainstormed ideas that on things you would like the agencies to consider as they're building the scenarios for the next version of system plan, which is system plan 10. Don't worry, it'll all become clear here in a minute when, when Jim and Dan explain it. Um, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna take some raw notes on screen because Jim and Dan have a meeting next week and they want your ideas before they go into that meeting. So the, the timing is brainstorm timing, not advice and consensus timing. Does that make sense? And with that, I'm gonna let Dan drive and Jim sidekick things. Well, thank you, Ruth. Jim, do you wanna uh, make any opening comments? Well, I just will say I'm new. I'm the new DOE lead for the system planning efforts. I sat in some of the meetings previously with uh, Kaylin Burnett, who was the, uh, the lead previously, I think for the last couple of system plans at least. And so uh, it's a good opportunity to get together and, uh, you know, work with ecology and take a look at some of these, uh, you know, what if type scenarios. So I wanted to go ahead and uh, Dan had requested the topic here to kind of just do a little bit of a sounding board and give these guys some history. So I'm here to support and uh, listen in. All right. Well, first of all, the HAFACO document and the links to system plan eight and nine, I have sent those to Ruth. So as needed, you members can contact Ruth and she can get you the links or forward things to you. So you can look in detail at some of the things we're gonna discuss today. So, system plan 10. The genesis of it is out of the tripartite agreement in 1989. Milestone within that document, M6240, says in part, submit a system plan to ecology describing the disposition of all tank waste managed by the Office of River Protection, including the retrieval of all tanks not addressed by specifics, my word, in the consent decree. So what does that mean? Full life cycle of the project at large is to be considered within the system plan. What it is and what it is not. The system plan is a computer modeling exercise primarily. System plan evaluates a set of technical scenarios and provides rough cost and schedule, and that's important to remember. Early on in the estimates, these are what are called class five estimates. For those of you who don't know, a class five estimate is plus 100% minus 50% typically. So there's a huge range for the cost estimates. Schedule estimates are the best they can be given the information at time based on what we've done in the past and based on extrapolation to future events. All of that is said to say 
that if you're looking for specific precision and cost estimates and schedule estimates, you will not find it in system plan. System plan is not a decision document or budget document, so schedule and cost remains somewhat, if you will, at large during this process. Further analysis is needed to fully understand how the system plan assumptions and conditions, cost, scope, and schedule, interact with one another to impact cost, scopes, and schedule. And this is why Tim and I are going to ask for some uh, brainstorming today because the conditions interacting with one another impact things. And it's some of those conditions that we'd like to hear from you in terms of considerations for how we go forward. Now, in the system plan, it includes a variety of things. And in the tri-party agreement document, the HFACO, in the pages I've listed here are overall minimum requirements, tank waste treatment, supplemental treatment, tank waste retrieval and contingency planning. And what I'm going to do is shift for a moment to some of these other documents so you can see what I'm talking about. This is the HFACO document, and you can see here, and I'm going to scroll slowly as I can, under M6240, starting on page D26. It talks about what the plan is, how often to do it, what it's about, and then it gets into some minimum overall requirements. Planning basis, key issues, assumptions, and vulnerabilities, sensitivity analysis, and so on. It talks about cost comparisons. New equipment technology, identification of issues, techniques, or technologies. All three of these is fair game and good fodder for consideration. And again, that's why we want to hear from you today. It talks about tank waste treatment. It talks about vitrification, supplemental treatment. I could go on and on and on, but you kind of get the idea here. Retrieval and other kinds of things. Now, all of these requirements, given certain inputs from ecology and HAB in the past, and ecology, of course, were turned into scenarios for system planning. This is what system plan eight scenarios look like. The baseline case is what we call the program of record, or if you will, the documented case that DOE is operating under at the current time of the system plan genesis. You'll see down here, that there were 11 scenarios built for system plan eight, some suggested by DOE, some suggested by ecology, and some suggested uh, between the two. You can see here that they're very different. I wanna bring your attention to one. Scenario number six here is tri-party agreement compliant. What that means is we built an assumption with end dates to meet the tri-party agreement requirements the 2040s, the 2047s, and other kinds of things that you become familiar with. The other scenarios were built with open-ended dates. They were built based on the requirements set and the assumptions going forward, and we let the date be whatever the date was going to be. Now, this is System Plan 8. For System Plan 9, we carried that Scenario 6 forward into a tri-party agreement compliant scenario for System Plan 9, and we just referenced back to System Plan 8. We're going to do the same thing in system plan 10 because the caveats, conditions, and constraints haven't changed for a tri-party agreement compliant at this particular point. So we'll carry that forward and point back to it as we go forward. Now, coming forward to system plan 9, there are a variety of scenarios with sensitivities here, and you'll see this starting on page XIII. Again, Ruth can make these available. I would strongly ask, strongly suggest that you go back through System Plan 8 and System Plan 9 and look at them in relation to what the, the HFACO tri-party agreement says. And with that in mind, keep that in mind as we go forward. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should have done it before today. However, as we go forward, it will help perhaps give you some new ideas. Now, what we did in System Plan 9, there are some treatment favored scenarios and there are some retrieval favored scenarios. And they are different in terms of their impact and their importance. You'll see here, 
add new DSTs to a treatment favored scenario. Slower ramp up, increased WTP TOE, which is total operating efficiency. More treatment favors, retrieval favors, periodic DST failures. We picked one in particular in system plan eight. And Jay Decker, who was our chief engineer, was given the task of figuring out from his perspective which tanks he believed, based on current information, were likely to fail and in what order. Now, another engineer could have picked a different set. Two engineers could have picked two different sets, but this is the one that we chose to go on. So, the number of scenarios and the kinds of information to be considered is wide and it's varied. So at this particular point, unless there's a variety of questions, what I would like to do is take you back to this scenario. And starting now, let you know that we are beginning regular meetings to set the foundation for system plan 10. We've already had three. We're going to keep going. The idea is to have scenario descriptions forward to DOE and ECY management by late July or early August. And the reason that's important is because under the current uh, protocols, DOE management and ecology management are required to sign off on the scenario set before we move forward to start building the model scenario request and start putting assumptions and criteria together. The current schedule is to have that done, as you see here, by late early and late July or early August, and that means most of the considerations for the assumptions and, and, and criteria for the scenarios needs to be in place at that point in time. Then by October, essentially those scenarios are signed off on and the actual modeling work begins. A year hence, which is October of 23, or a little before then, the actual system plan 10 should be ready for publication. So that's kind of our very high level timeline. So at this particular point, I want to turn it over to Ruth as a moderator and start getting some ideas from you folks. If you have questions, please ask them. If you have just suggestions, uh, forward those as well. We have several pe people taking notes, so we'll do what we can to see to it that your interests are brought forward. Now, two caveats here. This conversation is about system planning only. It is not about analysis of alternatives. It is not about holistic negotiations. Ecology has no comment on AOA and has no comment on holistic negotiations. So with those ground rules, Ruth, take it away. All right, I've got two folks in queue. Um, I know we've got some folks who are relatively new to the tanks committee with us. Um, do not let the old timers scare you into keeping your mouth shut. So if something doesn't make sense, if you want to make a comment, you want to ask a question, um, get yourself in there. I want you to be heard as well as um, our old timers, OK? And Ruth, what I would offer, are if some of the folks who are newer to this don't understand the frame of reference and how to ask the right kinds of questions, please let them ask that question. And between Jim and I, we can probably help move that along. What is your definition of a double shell tank leak? A double shell tank leak is a confirmed leak anywhere within the annulus space, the inner tank or the outer tank. And Jim, jump in here whenever you need to. I mean, for background, the, the only double shell tank leak that was identified was an AY2. And so that had involved a number of actions uh, so that was the uh, the classic. Well, the first one that actually we've dealt with here. So, and there's tons of background information on that, which I don't know all the details on, but that was uh, a, a joint effort between us and Ecology on response to that. So, so I've got I've got a cue. Um, make sure, you know, raise your hand. Let me know if you want to speak up, and I'm going to check with the folks on the phone as well. Jeff, you're first, followed by Bob. Jeff. Great. Um, thanks for the opportunity to kind of throw some spaghetti at the wall here. Um, I have it has sauce. Things. Yeah. 
I have a whole list of things that I would ask the crystal ball, uh, whether they're good questions or not, I don't know. Um, but I don't want to just give you the deluge. My first question is, are there any scenarios that you all are favoring so far that you don't think the previous system plans have answered to your satisfaction or you know, what are you working with so far? We're too early in the process at this point, Jeff. What we're doing is taking a look at some of the history and taking a look at some of the foundational information that's associated with the baseline case. As far as what we're going to go forward with, I don't know from Ecology's perspective whether or not we have specifics that we could lay out to you at this point as a well-rounded scenario. Fair enough. Um, let me just throw maybe two at you and then I'll get back in the back of the line. Um, I noticed that in system plan nine, the five tanks that were picked to look at failures, they're all on the east side. And it just makes me wonder, would the result have been different if one or more of those tanks had been on the west side instead? And does the timing of that failure affect the mission differently? Um, so, so that's what I'm hearing you suggest is consider the idea that tank failures are not just on east side. And in considering that, what potential impacts might there be on the timing of the mission? Did I get that right? That's right. Thank you. Um, the next one that I would ask, we have kind of a an imaginary scenario in the heads of some of us in the tank waste committee that if there was an opportunity to remove the remaining interstitial liquid from the single shell tanks and get that treated for offsite disposal, that that could positively improve the conditions in the soil under the tanks. What I don't know is if we could remove that 3 million gallons of interstitial liquid via some parallel process not addressed by your system plan, would that have any effect on the cost or timing of the treatment of the main tank waste, or would it have no effect at all? So or, what is it you're asking in terms of a scenario consideration, Jeff? Are you asking, first yes, of all, imagine. whether or not the interstitial liquid can be removed, first of all? Secondly, are you asking, should the interstitial liquid be removed, what impact does that have on cost, scope, and schedule for mission? That's right. The second one, let's let's assume, since we're all built on assumptions here, let's assume you could make those 3.34 million gallons of interstitial liquid disappear and just take them out of this. Now, but would that have an effect on the larger treatment mission or not? Recognizing right. that your assumption about pulling those gallons of liquid out is a huge lift in and of itself. Recognizing that. I'm just trying to figure out, is it worth it? Does it save the mission anything if you could? Okay, understand, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, Jeff, you wanna be like Dopey and Snow White and go back to the end of the line? How to go with that? Thank you. That's the image I have, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dopey? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Grandchildren in movies. Um, yeah, Bob, save me. Hey, Jim, long time no see. And, well, kind of virtual see anyway. Um, I, I guess my main question is, how exactly is the system plan used? Uh, when you guys turn these out, I see all the numbers, all the the dates, but I, I never really understand how is it used in planning? So, uh, go first? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. What I would offer is this, Bob, and this is not going to satisfy you, just know up front. The system plan, along with a variety of other mechanisms and venues, are used in early planning, and they are used as contributors to the need for decision making. And that's about it. Hmm. OK, <laughs> all right, you're right. Didn't satisfy me. So um, 
things I, I guess I'd ask you to think about when you put together your scenarios is right now we are seeing very high inflation. Uh, I know you have a, a process where you plan on 3%, but we're higher now. Uh, and I would hopefully have you look at inflation, at least what, what it is now and how that is going to impact the the bottom line when we get out there many years from now. Because uh, a couple percent of inflation makes a big difference over the years. Uh, also, uh, TBI. If we could actually move some of this waste off-site to a, another place doing another process, uh, I think that should be factored in also uh, as an option to uh, handling some of this waste in parallel. So those are two things I, I guess I'd like you to look at. Let me respond to the first one. <clears throat> You're absolutely correct that Money these days is more expensive than it might have been. What I will tell you is that net present value and escalation factors are considered in the development of the scenarios. It is fair for discussion to determine whether or not the classic two to four percent escalation rates are still relevant. It is also <clears throat> appropriate given the potential for differences in time frames to determine whether or not the net present value numbers that have been used in the past are still relevant to be used. So yes, thank you, those are good points. As far as TBI is concerned, at this particular point, you've heard what DOE has to say about TBI. The Department of Ecology has not yet seen a permit application for that. So at this particular point, there's really no foundation for considering what, if you will, alternative or parallel operations might look like with a TBI. That's yet to come, as I understand it. Hmm. OK, thank you. We've got one person on the phone at 5999. Do you want to jump in with a question, a comment, a suggestion? Um, adding folks to the queue, Liz and then Steve Wigman. <clears throat> Liz? Sorry, it took me a minute to get off mute. Um, I guess I have a question and then or maybe it's a two part question. One is um, just I don't it would be helpful if you could talk about how the system plan talks to the life cycle scope schedule cost report. Because they have, they're both kind of trying to guess at the future. Um, and it seems like they kind of talk together, but they don't necessarily have the same conclusions. Um, and then the other question I have is about um, it, it, my understanding with the system plan is each scenario is its own bounded thing. They don't, you're not taking bits and pieces. It's not like I want like 1A plus 2C plus 3B run that. Um, and that's always puzzled me a little bit why we don't have something that's more like just pieces that you put together into different scenarios. Um, and I know I've asked this before and I never remember why. Let me answer. Let, let me answer number two. I'll leave number one to Jim on the life cycle cost report. On the scenarios themselves, <clears throat> to a greater or lesser degree, you're right, Liz. The scenarios are built independently from, if you will, soup to nuts, cost scope and schedule, parameters, assumptions, and criteria sets. That said, please remember that the sensitivities in the system plan are built off a particular scenario. So a sensitivity will be same as except for one or two criteria or assumptions. So the foundation, and I'm going to use just letters for the moment for convenience. If scenario A says everything's green, we can build a sensitivity A1 that says everything's green except for this piece and that's blue. And if you look at the system plans, that is what has been done. So anywhere you see a sensitivity, 
it is, if you will, a spin-off from its base scenario. <clears throat> So the, uh, the first question on the system plan and the uh, life cycle report, which actually is a different milestone, right? It comes out, I think, kind of an alternating a year or two after the system plan gets uh, published. Um, and, you know, the system plan is not a decision document that necessarily will feed into that complete process. But uh, as we talked about, we have to kind of have a snapshot in time to look at these kind of different scenarios. And right now we are working through the baseline, like what has changed in the last three years. Uh, within the milestone, we talk about constrained and unconstrained uh, <clears throat> profiles. And some of that deals with how we uh, may or may not be receiving funding, et cetera, Liz. And so we want to be sure that we're covering things from a technical perspective in our baseline uh, that we will look at, you know, but the actual life cycle report is its own effort at a larger scale that looks beyond just the tank waste mission, you know, for the whole Hampton site mission. Uh, and so those teams work together, uh, but it's a different sort of effort as we get their uh, input, you know, it's a little bit staggered and we manage our baselines, you know, in more real time if we can and help play into that as well. But that's kind of uh, the answer in terms of it's not a direct correlation, right? But it, it's something that we try to work those teams together and, you know, even for the life cycle report, that's a similar thing where we have to do a snapshot in time. So that's my understanding of that. In terms of, yeah, like Dan said, for the scenarios and the sensitivity analysis, but uh, we set up the full scenario. And then if we want to tweak, you know, one or two aspects of that, you can run a sensitivity analysis. Uh, and that's kind of how they approach this in plan nine. All right. I've got five people in queue. Steve and then Jeff. Steve Wigman. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess my question really relates to having read <clears throat> a number of system plans over the year uh, years and your statement of how it's sort of not used. And I'm wondering why are we doing it? What would, what would happen? What would we lose if we quit wasting money doing this thing? Well, what I would offer first, Steve, is I don't believe it's a waste of money. Good. It is it is a tri-party requirement. Yes. And both DOE and Ecology are bound by it. That said, when you take a look at what's in the system plan, there's a variety of classic assumptions and criteria sets that go into that. It exercises the baseline as you know it today, plus a variety of what if we do something differently. And many of the scenarios that are built in system plan are based on, if you will, current events. Tank leaks is a good example. What if this happens? Direct feed law, what if that happens and so on? So at least from ecology's perspective, it is seen as a viable, relevant uh, tool, tool in the toolbox for continued use. Jim? You know, and the other aspect of this, Steve, too, that I think is really valuable is it really just, you know, it's an ecology and DOE product that we work together and we sit in the same room. We we'll talk about, you know, what has changed, in, you know, the last three years. Uh, you know, we hear out different scenarios. And I think that that is in itself very valuable. You know, we may, uh, you know, we come to either, like coming to an agreement on the baseline and coming to some discussion on the uh, scenarios. And that joint effort where we sign off as both ecology and DOE that, hey, we sat down and talked about these things. It is a modeling exercise. And, you know, between when we draw the line in the sand and when the actual plan comes out, things can change, obviously. That's a valuable exercise. And keep in mind, it's not the last bite of uh, the apple from the public perspective. You know, Dan mentions things like the permitting process and other things that move forward. And I think almost more of a real time aspect in this planning, but at least it kind of gives us an opportunity to sit down and talk about that and look at things that may have changed, you know, technologies, et cetera. And so I think uh, getting us in the same room and just discussing these things is in itself very valuable. I guess part of my concern relates to people who read it who don't know what it was for and may misuse the information. Uh, not knowing that it's not a decision document, 
<clears throat> because as an engineer, I don't write documents that aren't decision documents. So I would propose that you consider tying this more to real time decision making as opposed to just a computer exercise. Because computer exercises are just that. Well, thank you, Steve, for that perspective. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> All right, I've got Jeff and Pam next up. Jeff? OK, I've got to keep going through my list here. To build on what Steve just said, I know that the boundaries for the conversation are that we're not talking about the analysis of alternatives and we are not talking about the holistic negotiations. I do hope that somewhere there is a model that looks at the scenarios that are rising to the top in those discussions and that those will be publicly available to understand how that vision of the future corresponds to some of these other alternatives that we are looking at. Um, and in addition to that, Let's say that you have a kind of preferred vision of what the system looks like based in the holistics and the AOA. I would like to see somewhere, whether it's in that process or in the system plan, throwing some curveballs at that scenario to see how resilient it is to things not going as planned. Um, so that that's the first one to kind of tie it to. Um, oh, darn. Sorry, I got to take a call. I'll be right back. So essentially, he's suggesting, you know, two outs, a base runner on second, and the pitcher is going to throw a curveball. What is that going to do? Yeah, or you know, you've got a new vision of the future that everyone's going to be hopeful about. Well, let's let's stress test that one too. Um, the next one on my list, the Tisker Ion Exchange columns. We are going to be generating a bunch of them, presumably. Um, we can assume that a Tisker-like system persists throughout the mission. That could be a scenario into itself, but I'm thinking more about the final dispositioning of those columns. Right now, oh, sorry, forgive me. Um, we can come back to me. So if I, if, if Jeff is asking what is going to happen in terms of final disposition to the columns, that is a, a point for consideration. Pam, thank you for waiting. Thank you. Um, OK, so I am. Um, listened to many conversations um, about the system plan, and I, I am not an engineer, not an expert, um, but I, I want to build. Uh, first of all, I want to follow up on um, the discussion about TBI. Um, so Jim, it's awesome to see you. Get your get your peeps to submit that uh, permit request to Ecology. TBI is important to us. Okay, second, I have sat through so many briefings where the Savannah River site is hired to brief the National Academies on what's going on with our tanks and tank waste treatment. And they keep referring to the system plan as if it's a traditional system plan. And it isn't from my understanding. And they're using it as a tool um, to manipulate the conversation. So I really encourage you in the opening, you've already said it's not a decision document. It's required by the tri-party agreement. Define a little better what it is and what it isn't. So, cause the, the National Academy is gonna be back and. God only knows why Savannah River gets hired to evaluate us, but they botch it every time. Thank you. I, I, oh, we have big. Okay, Jacob, I'm going to put you in queue because um, not everybody can see the chat. We've got some folks who are both on the phone and technologically challenged at the moment. So um, Dan Solitz, Chris, and then I'm going to I'm going to go to Jacob. Dan. Dan Solitz, are you there? Get you off a of mute. Your hand. OK, thank you. Uh, having a hard time getting my unmute button to work. Uh, the evaporator is getting quite elderly, and so I guess it's two, two scenarios. One is that 
an unexpected failure of the evaporator and two, a planned replacement of the evaporator. So if I'm hearing you correctly, Dan, one scenario would be things doing quite well and all of a sudden the evaporator fails with no readily replaceable component set? Yes. Second scenario, 242A Please. fails or 242 goes down for remove and replace. Which of those is important? Well, hopefully the remove and the, the replace is already there and then it, it goes down for remove. Okay, so what you're talking about is a planned outage. Yeah, planned outage, planned replacement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Chris, Jacob, and Jeff. Chris? Right, I have two questions and they're, I guess they're basically related. Now, in 2023, um, presumably DF law will pass its operational readiness review, go into hot commissioning, and hopefully in late 2023 or early 2024, start processing waste, hot waste. So we're going down a path right now, a scenario right today, which will allow us to pass ORR, which will allow us to go into hot commissioning and start processing. So that's a scenario. Now, the other scenario, another scenario is, or an ancillary scenario is, the federally funded research and development center recently released their report and Jeff was nice enough to give a link to us yesterday that said in order to process 50 the remaining 50% of the law waste that DF law cannot process they recommend going to offsite mecha different mechanisms to our offsite grout so that would be a second scenario so my question is, why don't we just have two scenarios in the next report? Because that seems to be the way we're going. And then any other scenarios could be the curveball scenarios that maybe Bob has, has thrown in. So I'm not sure why we need more than two scenarios. The one we're going down right now, assuming everything works okay. And then the second scenario is we process 50% of the law uh, by grouting it off site. Okay, thank you for that perspective. It looks like Ruth has it. If not, Ryan has me covered as well as Josh. <laughs> All right, Jacob, you had some stuff in the in the chat and um, can you add your ideas here so I can capture them this way? Okay. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I don't know why, but my phone doesn't doesn't like star six. Um, so I have to do it multiple times before it believes me. Um, so so this you know isn't really the objective that ecology was trying to get. But as I was listening to Steve Wigman's comments about what the purpose of the report is, um, you know, I was going down memory lane many years ago, and. Uh, uh, when I read my first system plan, and, and I, I get invited to speak to a lot of people, most often tank chemistry, but the only thing I get asked to speak more often about than tank chemistry is, is to speak about my checklist of key elements of a technical report that I wrote after reading about system plan five or six or so, um, which I don't think was called a system plan at the time. Uh, and I, I read the report, and it was thousands of pages. And, and uh, uh, the only reason I would read so many pages is because I was forced to for my job. And I just thought, why am I reading so much that doesn't seem to be adding any value? And at the end of that, I uh, diagnosed what I thought was wrong with that version of the system plan. Like I say, this was years ago. And, and out of that, I came up with a checklist. 
And I said, if you're if your technical report meets this checklist, you will never have Jake Reynolds disgusted with your report after you are done. And I thought uh, I would uh, you know provide it to Steve and Dan, and and uh, uh, just it could be a useful tool to them um, to make sure that the this new system plan you know um, doesn't answers the sort of questions that, that Steve Wigman and Pam raised um, about what, what am I learning and how am I using it and so forth. Uh, by the way, System Plan 9 comes awfully close to meeting this checklist. It's still thousands of pages, which meant no one read it, but if they had, it, it, uh, it comes pretty close to meeting, meeting my checklist. So that, that was a good job. Well, thank you for that. We appreciate it. Ruth, can you see to it that we capture these items? Yeah, let me highlight this and we can go back and pull that out of that. Just so Jim and I can discuss it in our group. Right. Yeah, see, but I'll, I'll pull that in. All right. Um, Jeff Lyon, it would help me to understand what the objective is for these considerations from the TWC. Okay, um, back to Jeff's question. Dan, can you reiterate what we're trying to capture here in this brainstorm? I can. What we're trying to do is, for those of you who have been on the HAB for quite a while, you may remember that there have been more than one times where the HAB Tank Waste Committee has felt that there was not enough input, if you will, allowed from them during the genesis of the system plan process. What Jim and I are trying to accomplish today is a brainstorm of ideas in no particular order to get out on paper a variety of things for us to consider when we begin the system plan planning in earnest. I'm not suggesting that all of these ideas will go forward, but what we're doing is getting a good idea of, uh, if you will, the lay of the land from the HAB population. And then one of the things we're going to do is take a look at all of these ideas and see if there's a common thread. Those common threads may be raised to the level of further discussion between Jim and myself, and then the uh, system plan team, and we'll go from there. So this, if you will, is the first sifting of ideas. And Jim and I thought this would be a good way to go to ensure, first of all, that we're getting a lot of well-rounded ideas, but secondly, the fact that they're timely, and actually third, that the HAB TWC recognizes that they have a part in some of this input. Up. That help, Jeff. Jeff Lyon. So, next in queue, I've got Jeff Burright and Steve Wigman. So okay. Back to Jeff. Should get no more interruptions. Um, if we can go back to number eleven, that's where I was uh, interrupted by my call. What I was looking for was. I'd like to see the scenario that involves incorporating the Tisker columns into glass so that we can understand what the infrastructure needs are of that can opener facility to then pour it into your glass mixture and what the extra cost and schedule needs of that are. I'm also curious to see a scenario in which it is decided at some future date that those Tisker columns are not indeed high level waste, do not need to be incorporated in the glass and are disposed in some other fashion is there an effect on the mission if that alternative future were to come to pass? And what would that look like? Um, so there's that. Um, Chris Sutton mentioned the National Academy's report. Uh, if you could, in your discussions, take a look at and try to figure out what scenario they have in their head when they're looking at an offsite grout option and then to incorporate that into the system plan. My fear is, and I haven't read the report yet, my fear is that they're focusing so much on what they can do with like a direct to grout option 
that they might be missing some of the larger system effects. Like, are you going to have a buildup of sludge in some way that's going to affect your mission? Um, you know, how is it going to affect your tank space needs? All of those things. And maybe they've looked at it. Maybe they haven't. I'd, I'd just like to see the system plan integrate with the scenario they've got in their heads. Um, kind of on those lines, the National Academies during the last study had said, you know, what if we could glass the hard stuff and grout the easy stuff? And by easy stuff, I mean the stuff that doesn't have a lot of organics in it or that doesn't have a lot of tech and iodine in it based on what we know about the inventory of each tank. And it's a nice idea to talk about, but I wonder if that capability to actually have that level of control is even possible. And what would that look like in practice if someone tried to do that? So, so what is the suggestion for consideration? A situation in which there is a combined vitrification and grouting alternative, but you separate the waste streams to each alternative based on the um, inventory of the stream at that moment in time. So, so essentially just, par parallel processing according to constituents of concern. Yeah, yeah, that, yes. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's what I've got so far. Thanks again for the opportunity to talk this through. Okay, so are you going to the back of the line again? Yeah. Okay. Or just I'm out of the line for now. Thank you. All right. Out of the line. Okay. I have Steve Wakeman, Jeff Lyon, and Chris Sutton. Steve. <clears throat> yeah, I think some of uh, Jeff's ideas would add value to the document. <clears throat> I would I would hope that you'd be doing those analyses in any case, whether it was in the system plan or not. But my my question would be. You know, I, I read all the assumptions. I read all the documents last time, tried to decipher the graphics. And I find it sometimes very useful to have a summary, kind of a separate short executive summary of a document that's very difficult to read. And I would like to ask you to consider having a summary that humanoids can understand. Well, what I would offer is this. We heard you during system plan six, seven, and eight, and we tried to transcend to what you're asking for in system plan nine. You'll see that system plan nine is organized differently than some of the earlier system plans. And what you'll see in what I will call front piece or executive land, there's a variety of summary information that gets to the point very quickly. And then as you go down through the document, you'll get into some of the graphs and further details and that kind of stuff. So I would ask you, Steve, and I'm not asking you to read the whole thing. Take a look at the difference between System Plan 8 and System Plan 9 for about the first 30 or 40 pages and yeah. see if what you're suggesting has already been worked on. Good, thank you. I will, I will do that. Jeff Lyon. Thank you. I wanted to uh, clarify what my statement was in the chat box. I was wondering uh, what I I do participate in these discussions with Dan and Jim, and uh, I I would appreciate understanding more or less what the Tank Waste Committee is trying to gather from this information. And uh, if you'll scroll back up to the uh, evaporator one, that would be a good example of, of the why and Jeff Burright also said it's you know he added the sentence so so we can understand what the effect of blank is to blank and in the case of the evaporator um, we we know that if you have a loss of the evaporator it will increase the time for the mission and it will require shutdowns and uh, possibly shutdowns and stuff like that for the equipment so um, putting a scenario together with the evaporator failure will result in an extended schedule. But if the uh, person on the tank waste committee that is asking for that, wants some other different analysis, it's always helpful to know, you know what you're really looking for. Because when we go through these, if, if, if we think we've got a scenario that um, beats 
your criteria, then that, that will help us to evaluate some of the input that you gave us over. Chris, I have you next up. I think one of the things that we're trying to understand is that there are a number of reports that are that 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 are issued by by DOE and, and 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 other agencies. And I think in terms of us presenting good advice, one of the things we like to know is the consistency between these reports and the consistency of assumptions and things like that. So for example, uh, tomorrow I'm going to be talking about the life cycle report. And in there, it gives costs for a baseline scenario, life cycle cost for a baseline scenario for the site, but also by PBS, uh, which includes DF law and high level waste. Okay, those costs are more or less consistent with what's in, with what's in the life cycle report system plan nine. Uh, because it says flat out, it uses system plan nine as kind of a baseline for the life cycle cost. However, it also presents a worst case scenario, which is about two and a half times the cost of the baseline scenario. When I look in system plan nine, in all the cost of the various scenarios, there's absolutely nothing which represents two and a half times the cost of the baseline scenario in system plan nine or system plan eight. So there's a fundamental difference in how these two major reports are handling assumptions about risk, assumptions about cost and assumptions about, about schedule with regard to presumably different scenarios. And it would be nice, for example, for us in HAB and, and the public to know what the differences are because both of these are, are, are in the public domain now. So one of the things I would like to see in system plan 10 is maybe in the scenarios or in the cost that's presented, more consistency with what's in the life cycle report with regard to best case and worst case. Or, Thank you. I, I, I understand what you're asking for, and that will not happen in system plan space. The system plan assumption and criteria set and cost profiles are built from a certain frame of reference. The life cycle cost is built from a different frame of reference. Typically in the system plan arena, the best case, nominal case and worst case cost scope and schedules are not built. There is a single model scenario request that's built based on assumption sets, ramp up and a variety of other things that are primarily technical in nature and cost and escalations are associated with that for one case run alone. That's different than what the life cycle cost profile does. Jim? That's true, but it's confusing to, let's say, people who are not experts in in how you how you do these life cycle costs. So on one report, you see one set of life cycle costs. In another report, you see another set and so on and so forth. And that's confusing. And I think that's one of the things that we would like to see is, is a lack of confusion in different things like this. One of the things that can be considered, and Jim and I will talk about it, is how well the baseline cost scope and schedule parameters are explained within the system plan so that the reader can get an idea, the frame of reference for those assumptions and criteria sets. So thank you for that. That's good information. Jim, do we need to check in with you as well on this one? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I was going to add, Chris, is we do want to, you know, maintain and take a look at how we describe these products as we roll them out, right? So system plan and its effort. Uh, among DOE and ecology, and I've heard a lot of that, I think, throughout our discussion is like, what are we using it for? We could certainly take that back and look at that and figure out ways that we can communicate the product and how we use that. You know, and also to keep in mind the timing for release of this document versus like a life cycle 
albeit the process is much different. Like Dan said, there's you know more of a range of analysis, a, a broader look, if you will. It's still important to understand the context of some of these different products, as well as the timing. And I think what's important, I think, from my perspective as we walk through this process is that we do have to cut it off as a snapshot and that the system plan is a, a technical look at some of these items. Again, we're not making full decisions. It's not a decision document, uh, but we do want to be able to capture that so people can understand, you know, especially when you talk about assumptions and things that go into our formulation of our scenarios. And a lot of that we do uh, put together as we work together with ecology and we complete our initial part of the milestone, which is the scenario selections to try to lay some of those things out for folks. And so, um, as you said, you know, Dan was saying, you know, we've tried to improve from system plan eight to system plan nine to make that more, um, you know, cognizant for people's awareness. And so we'll keep taking a look at those items as well, um, because it is in the best interest of everybody to understand uh, how these are products are put together and uh, used and how we have to put a snapshot in time for some of these things and just how dynamic things are on the site, right? So appreciate that thought. And so we'll take that back and take a look at that. Um, Bob's gonna have the last word. Jim, I don't know that I have your current email since you've been going different places in DOE. Um, so I wanna make sure you get a copy of this um, over lunch. Um, so you have it as soon as possible. Bob, you get the last word before we break for lunch. Okay, hey, I'd like to thank both uh, Dan and Jim because uh, you actually put us, the committee, the HAB in the loop and asked for our input. So we get a lot of uh, stuff that we're, we're not asked for input and this was, very good, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I was looking for a path forward. Uh, would you guys be willing to come back and give us an update when you are when you have selected the scenarios you're gonna use so we kind of have an idea of what we're gonna expect after you turn the crank on your computer and come out with the numbers? So uh, what, I would offer, what I would offer Bob and, and Jim follow on what I would offer Bob the best time to do it is probably in the September October time frame after both DOE and senior management have signed off and approved the scenario set that we're going to be running. I okay. think anything prior to that would be premature Jim. Yeah, let's we'll work through that formal to actually meet the milestone requirement, Bob. And uh, I think a lot of that actually gets shared as we get to completion, you know, goes into the TPA administrative record too. Um, but yeah, let's talk about that, Dan. Okay, sounds good. Right. Let me suggest that we <clears throat> we take lunch until 1.30. Um, I kind of need the full 90 today because we have two committee meetings tomorrow. Um, and we would come back at 1.30 and talk about the HAB draft work plan. Does that work for folks? Sounds good. Thank you guys for your time today. Hey, good seeing Jim. Yeah, thank you all for your input. It's valuable. We appreciate it. Uh, right. Bob, why don't we kick this off? Yes. So uh, welcome back to the uh, Tank Waste Committee. Uh, had a very good morning. I uh, learned a lot, had a lot of uh, opportunities to, to give input. And so this afternoon, we're going to be aimed at more committee and have business. And we're going to start off with uh, Gary Younger, who's going to talk us through his proposal for the 2023 work plan and calendar. And uh, as I was just mentioning to Ruth, I'd like to move up the leadership workshop topics 
because that kind of fits into this discussion. And so we'll uh, have our open forum and committee business after the break. So with that, Gary, you're up. Thanks, Bob. I do appreciate it. And uh, Ruth, if, if we could start off actually with the calendar first before we get into the work plan. And then what I'll do is, is I'll uh, talk through this a little bit to show you uh, uh, where it is we're looking to go. Then I'll let uh, uh, Ryan Miller from Ecology jump in. I don't think anybody from Ecology has joined us today, but to get uh, Ecology's perspective and then we'll open it up for questions and uh, go from there. Does that sound okay? Sorry, Gary. Gary this, uh, this is Dan McDonald from Ecology. I'm here. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> great. Yeah. And Sorry. As, long, as long as we've got folks from Ecology, that, that, that's good. Sorry, Gary, I'm here. I thought you meant when you said that Ecology wasn't here. I think you meant EPA, right? No, what, yeah, I, I didn't think EPA is there. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Well, first off, uh, uh, even though we it seems like we just started this uh, calendar year not too long ago, we're already looking into the next calendar year, which begins in October. And, and we've learned some lessons over the year. Uh, past few months and also as we've been doing some outreach, we're, we're hearing some comments from folks and hopefully this new calendar and uh, new work plan helps to address some of those comments that we've heard and uh, see if we can uh, uh, help help <coughs> committees and, and help the board be a, maybe a, a bit more focused, also do better outreach with the public and uh, so I hope that this meets a lot of those uh, criteria that we're looking for. Uh, as, as we look at the calendar, we're looking at some of the same colorings uh, that we've had over the past few years, and we've got a couple of changes in there. The darker blue are the committee uh, meetings as we are used to right now. Uh, the purple that you see are federal holidays, uh, which means that not only will, will my office be closed, but the uh, facilitation office is closed on those same days, and because for, for the most part, because they, they mostly align with the federal uh, uh, calendar there. A couple of things that are a little bit different is you've got a bright red, which you see six of them in, in the uh, calendar, and those are board presentation meetings. And I'll explain that in a couple of moments. And then the, uh, the darker red, those are board work meetings. And then the uh, yellow, that you see is a proposed leadership workshop. And uh, the light blue that you see four dots on there, that's a uh, half day committee of the whole meeting. So let me kind of explain some of these things as we get into that so that uh, we understand the methodology behind that. Quarterly meetings we're finding out, particularly at the board level, uh, uh, we're cramming too much stuff in without really giving the board an opportunity to absorb a lot of the information. So what we're looking at doing, and, and we're also not doing a very good job of, of being accessible to the public. Uh, many folks are working nine to five, uh, putting food on the family's table. And uh, so what we're looking at is on the uh, bright red dots that you see, uh, those are going to be presentation <laughs> meetings and those are geared for uh, evenings. So we're tentatively looking at starting those meetings at 5 p.m. and going to 7.30. Uh, timing may change a bit, but that's what we're looking at uh, to start off with. 
and and this is a conversation starter. This this is firmly implanted in Jello, which means that we can move things around as necessary. So the bright red will be presentation meetings for uh, to primarily reach the public. We're not looking to do uh, board business during those times. We're we're trying to have a a more open conversation, kind of like what we did this morning uh, with with uh, Tom Fletcher, Delmar Noyes, and and Janet Dedeker, is have a presentation and have a discussion. We're going to have a lot of the usual type briefings that we have with with a DOE Ecology and EPA giving regular updates, and then we will come up with a topic to throw in after that to allow people to get a better understanding of what's going on around the site, uh, some progress, some, some future plans, things like that. Uh, we recognize that every presentation requires some sort of work. So the next day, after the presentation, we're looking at having two four-hour blocks uh, for work. There will be a morning block that goes from 8 a.m. to 11, and uh, that will be where a lot of discussion takes place on items. If, if you want to discuss advice, uh, do some uh, wordsmithing, et cetera. The afternoon is where action would be. So if you need to pass some advice, uh, you know, vote on, uh, like, like say, the, the uh, work plan or whatever. And, and uh, those actions can take place. And because we're doing this every other month, hopefully there won't be this feeling of, of rushing through things where, where committees can't, or where the board can go through and really consider and deliberate on items and knowing that if they can't get to where they need to be in one meeting, it's not going to be three months before they get a chance to tackle it again. They're looking at only two months. So hopefully that will help uh, help help alleviate a, a lot of the anxiety that the current schedule has. With board with with uh, uh, committee meetings, what we're looking at doing is <clears throat> it, let's say for instance October and November. We're looking at having uh, a presentation type meeting. And we're looking at two different things, either presentations all in October with committee business in uh, November, or uh, having maybe one presentation for the October meeting and then another presentation in, in November with the afternoon being discussion. Uh, we're also looking to, to maybe look at some alternate uh, schedules to kind of change that up a little bit. But we're finding out that a lot of people are having trouble sitting through full day meetings. Uh, they want to break that up some. And we're also finding that, that that's a barrier for some members who don't uh, don't uh, attend all the time, who maybe aren't retired or they've got other things going on is that breaking things up a little bit helps uh, could help with attendance. So th these are some things we're looking at trying to do. Uh, the uh, and, and basically it's, it's eliminating long day meetings and replacing it with two shorter blocks to be able to go through and uh, you know, meet some of that need of people not being able to sit through very long uh, meetings. And then March, you see we've got uh, three yellow blocks. And uh, first thought is to spread out leadership workshop over three uh, afternoons. Uh, that is also flexible. Uh, looking to do, you know, like I said, trying to get away from the long eight hour meetings and be respectful of, of folks time. If you look at July, 
you'll see that it is pretty much along the same line that we have done over the past couple of years is there's one month where we don't book any business so that people can use that for vacations or whatever. I know that that the staff does a lot of work to try to clean up things during that time period. Uh, processes that may not be exactly right that we want to try and tweak a little bit. So we, we we're trying to hold that is kind of a uh, a rest month. And then we pick back up again and, and go from there. And then the flesh colored uh, or salmon colored dots that you see are regularly scheduled EIC meetings. Uh, as we go along. So I, I see we've got uh, why don't I stick to the calendar and let me answer some calendar related questions. Uh, Ryan, do you have anything to throw in before I, I take a few questions? I don't think so right now, Gary. I think I'll just echo what I've echoed the last couple um, committee meetings and, and I don't want to speak for EPA, but I could probably share the same comment that the EPA shared the last couple of days is that Ecology and EPA are reviewing the uh, work plan right now. Um, thanks to Gary for sharing this with us last week. We're, we're working with our individual agencies to get uh, together feedback from our managers and staff, and we'll be sharing that with with DOE. And and uh, I know I'm working with Gary to set up a, a time sometime soon to 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 take our feedback and, and hopefully implement it into the work plan. So that that's kind of an ongoing process at, at Ecology is, is I'm collecting feedback on on the work plan. Um, to provide comments on this. And uh, like I said, EPA had a similar sentiment. I don't want to speak for them, but that's what they said the last couple of days. And I think that's all I've got to share. Thank you. Uh, got Shelly and Bob in queue. Shelly? Thank you, Ruth. Thanks, Gary. I've got a couple of thoughts on this, and I, I'd like to I'd like to first understand when it is that the committees are going to hear subject matter experts in this array of data, or are sure. they? Sure, and Shelley, also, that's, that's a good question. And uh, that would be primarily during presentation meetings. So if for board meetings, you're looking at the brighter red colors, and when we do committees and we've got those broken out into two different months or two different time blocks, uh, you would have the presentations during the first of those two blocks, and then the second block would be available for uh, discussion. And like I said, th this is still uh, you know, being worked, and th this is the conversation starter. So when you say block, are you speaking to the evening session? that happens the evening before, that's when SMEs would come and speak? For the board meeting, yes. So, so people who work would have to come in the evening to make presentations or be available. Um, and I guess the other observation, Gary, from many years of doing this work is we have never, ever, ever been successful in getting people to come to evening meetings. And I don't see how this generates uh, a change in in that lack of response from the public. I think the only time we've had people really show up or when workers on site, they were you know back in the in the dose reconstruction project days when people were ill and wanted to speak and were pleading for help. And I I. Um, uh, I, th I, I, I want to know how, how does this, where's the rubber hit the road for this to make this be successful? And then how long would people have to, uh, you know, limp along with no one showing up in the evening before there was a change in plan again? And then the other question I have, and that's one that Pam brought up and three days is, is spread out is uh, not fair to board members who are volunteer. And uh, there needs to be some tightening up of, uh, of the schedule so that work can get done and people can get in and get out. And um, so that's another thought. Thanks. So if you could speak to 
how you're going to generate interest in, from the public. Uh, I'd appreciate hearing that. Sure thing, Shelley. We plan to uh, advertise this through social media and uh, probably maybe even, even traditional media to let people know of this opportunity. Uh, unlike in the past, we are recording these meetings now, so they are available uh, within a few days on our YouTube channel. Uh, we may also look at some other uh, possibilities where if somebody can't uh, log in online, um, maybe they could uh, get it, uh, you know, shortly thereafter. Uh, it's it's um like I said th this is a first shot work in progress and the same response for the uh, uh, leadership workshop. If it looks like three days is too long, I'm I'm perfectly fine with with changing it. Like I said, there's absolutely nothing in here that's in stone yet, and it's entirely possible we throw this whole thing out and start from scratch. But we're going to have to you know we're way far along in the process. So, uh, but like I said, this is the first shot, and this is part of the collaborative process where everybody gets involved to uh, put in comments and then uh, go from there. Thank you. Bob. Okay, and I know you've been having this. Uh, conversation through the pick and the rap meetings uh and so i'm sure there's a lot of good comments um i guess one of the positives i see is six board meetings that's i think that's a a, a step in the right direction uh but i i do really am concerned about how we pass advice uh, in the past, the first day we rolled it out, got comments, and then a, a group of us got together and, and rewrote the advice for the next day. And uh, having that all in one day now, I don't think would help that situation. Uh, what I would propose is Maybe you had start out with a half day business meeting uh, at noontime or one o'clock or for a half day board meeting where we take care of business, board business, like advice, things like that. And then you could have the presentation that evening um, and try to get more participation by the public. And then the next day in the morning, we could have the second half of our have business meeting. That way you can it, pass the advice, people can work on it and uh, have it ready for the next day. So uh, I think that's that's a possibility where your, your lighter red is both a have meeting in the afternoon and a presentation in the evening. Uh, and then I, I do see the Committee of the Holes, and I'm assuming that's going to be um, uh, like topics that are of interest to everybody, just like we tried to have a tanks and wrap joint meeting. Uh, I think some of those topics would have fed right into a Committee of the Whole discussion. But on those, you have them at the end of the week. I think the committee of the whole should be the first presentation of co committee week. And that way the committees can, can think about what they heard during the committee of the whole and uh, see if there's something they need to discuss because it's going to be of general interest to everybody. So my second recommendation would be to move the committee of the whole to the first presentation of committee week. Um, and I, I do support having more committee of the holes because a lot of the topics now are starting to be site-wide issues. 
Um, let's see. Oh, and then getting back to advice. Um, I, I guess I'm still very concerned about breaking up uh, one month for presentations and then the next month uh, having the committee meeting because you lose a lot of the um, train of thought there. Um, and <laughs> I know I, I have trouble remembering what we did just the last week and having a month in between, uh, I think it's going to make it difficult. So to have the presentation and then a related committee discussion follow it, that might be a, a better format than having presentations a month off and then discussion. Uh, also, it makes it very difficult for the way our process manual is set up right now, uh, for if the committee decides it wants to do advice, you need a committee meeting to charter the uh, issue manager team to go off and do it. And there's a, a long period of time uh, before you have another committee meeting where you could look at the advice they bring forward, approve it, and then have it go to the board meeting. So we have to, I think, look at that a little bit more too to make sure that the advice development process doesn't get broken in this calendar. And that's what the, the board is supposed to be providing to DOE is advice on topics. So um, those are my thoughts just off the top of my head here. Thank you. Bob, th those are some very good comments. And one of the things that I will ask is that, uh, as, and we're going to go into the work plan itself after we talk about other schedule uh, type questions, is Ruth has a, a word document that she's willing to give the committee so that you can go through and make your comments. Uh, the, the intent is to take feedback and uh, take that with what we get from the various committees, add it with the uh, feedback that we get from the regulators, and, you know, put it all together and come up with the uh, the document that, that everybody is, uh, is comfortable with. Like I said, this is a conversation starter, and I recognize that there are some things that we will need to change, and... Uh, that and there are a lot of things that should change frankly and that's that's part of the feedback process so uh hopefully ruth will be able to give you that copy and uh the committee can go through it and if there's even time today the, the uh, wrap spent about an hour had an, an hour hole in its uh uh time schedule yesterday uh, because they were quite efficient at getting through what they had and if you want to spend an hour or so redlining that, uh, we can look at that as well. So was this a red line to your draft uh, 2023 work plan? Is that what yes. they were marking up? Okay. Yes. My, my recommendation is that we keep them separate for the committees. Oh, because definitely. Because if we put four committees worth of red line on top of each other, BCC won't be able to read it. Yeah, bad things will happen. Yes, yeah, so yes, e each and committee I, I has its take... own opportunity. To yeah, um, just because I I don't want y'all to to be cross-eyed today, it'll be hard enough tomorrow. I've got Pam and Chris. Pam, thank you. Um, I agree with Bob's three points. I'll just lay that out there. Um, so I I have a couple questions, Gary. So. If we looked at the annual schedules of other SSABs, does this proposal mirror another site's annual calendar? That's a good question, and I I can't answer that because I haven't done that level. I'm just trying to figure out 
what's what works for the hab. Okay. So, so if, if you've got a suggestion, like I said, when, when Bob sends the uh, copy around and, and if you've got a, a suggestion like that uh, with, with some examples, please throw it on there. Um, so I'm really surprised that you brought this to us before you went to the regulators. Um, and you referred to people expressing opinions about um, too much time in the chair and so forth. So who who have you been talking to? Who has been providing input into this draft? A variety of people to include sitting HAB members. Uh, as we've been going out and doing uh, a recruitment for uh, vacancies on the board, that was actually a consistent uh, uh, comment from folks is that I'd like to attend, but the meetings are too long. And same thing with 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 uh, public is that I'd like to attend, but they're during the day when I'm working. Uh, so this is trying to come up with a way to reach the public better and also uh, meet the needs of some of those who don't have the ability to sit through an eight hour meeting, but maybe they can spend an afternoon or a morning uh, doing something. So, so there's there's a variety of, of inputs on this. And uh, like I said, this is a conversation starter to try to figure out what works best. Okay, thank you. Chris. Yeah, Gary, does this calendar and the related work plan have to be approved at headquarters? And if so, when is the drop dead date when you need resolution on on them in order to, to send it upward? And if they don't have to be approved, do you still have kind of a drop dead date when you like uh, a consensus approval on the, on the calendar and work plan? Excellent question, Chris. And let me go through that. And then we'll need to go over to the uh, work plan itself. Is uh, headquarters has already seen the basic concept and uh, we, we, th there were only a couple of minor uh, comments that headquarters had. Uh, the goal is to have this adopted by the board in the June meeting because uh, we know that there's going to be a lapse in uh, some memberships between uh, July 1st and October 1st and the uh, September meeting we may or may not have enough folks or the right folks at the table to be able to pass this much like what we had last year. So I would really like to be able to come out of the leadership workshop, which is uh, what May 18th with the 99% solution and let people kind of chew on it for a few weeks and then uh, when we hit the June meeting, which uh, let's see that the June board meetings, 22nd, 23rd. So I'm, I'm going to assume we're going to try to present this during that meeting for adoption. And that way we do that before we have the lapse of membership. Thank you. Yes, sir. Gary. Sorry, I didn't say what my camera wasn't on. Um, uh, I think it would behoove the executive board to do a put this out to not only new members, but uh, new applicants um, in terms of times and dates and have some, uh, you know, polling feedback. Um, you know, having just recruited someone as a new member of the board based on the prior existing calendar, um, I'm very concerned about a dramatic change that wasn't communicated before we tried to do any recruitment. It happens that for Alfonso, this may be a good choice based on his work. I mean, I but I think it's really important that we have a well-designed outreach to everyone, not haphazard outreach 
um, include some questions about, um, for example, if we did this um, with the evening meetings, would organizations commit to um, sharing out agendas at, uh, that might be of interest for people, the public to participate? I'm excited about the evening meeting idea, as I said in the last couple of days. But I think that we need to put this out, and I'm also very concerned about what it implies for participation, though, um, without doing a thorough survey. Um, I actually have been on email today with two different organizations that re would represent significant diversity being added to the board, and uh, we also need to see, have some materials or something about how groups can be added to the board uh, because um, we're very upset with an announcement that the board charter, which says the five regional environmental and Hanford public interest group seats are chosen by a coalition of environmental groups and public interest groups, um, is being thrown aside to put someone on board who is not only not adding diversity in a seat, but is at odds with the environmental community on its major priorities and at odds with the Latino community uh, in terms of their priorities and at odds with the labor community um, and the state of Washington in terms of health, safety, environmental justice. Um, so I think we need to be talking about how we conduct outreach for the seats and have something in writing about how seats can be nominated. Jerry, uh, thank you for the comments and, and let me uh, hit the first question was was uh, about uh, communicating this calendar. I'm OK with that. You know, that that's the whole point is uh, this is the dialogue that we're having. This is the first this is the conversation starter, uh, and uh, let's see where it takes us. And uh, I, I fully expect there to be some alteration, and I fully expect that groups such, such as uh, a Heart of America Northwest, and I also hope Columbia Riverkeeper and and Hanford Challenge and and all the other groups jump on board with letting folks know that we're going to have evening meetings because the intent is to have a dialogue during those times that we just don't have right now. Right. And I'm excited to try to, to before you that. go to the second question. I want to say thank you for that. I'm excited by that. And um, uh, you know, it's separate from the seat issue overall. And but um, whether it's Heart of America Northwest, my personal view, anyone's personal view or the individuals you've spoken to, I do think that the executive committee should work with you and Ruth to design a survey for all incoming and existing members um, so that we aren't doing this um, just based on individual, like the, you know, the executive committee members may all be perfect with the timing of this, but they may not be representative of all the different participants for some reason. That's okay. Thank you. And as far as the second question that you have, if you've got the name of somebody, just send them to me and, and I will start working with them. I, I need from you, and I've said this before, but I'll make it really clear. We need something in writing about the criteria and seat selection process and what that would mean. Um, and I would hope that for the five seats that would represent um, uh you know how rep, include the reference to the charter and past practice that you know for example when there was an open seat it was the regional public interest environmental groups that nominated citizens for a clean eastern washington as a consensus nomination out of a number of potential groups for that seat and that hasn't happened and we don't have anything in writing from you and I can't go to, I'm not going to name any of the groups, but I can't go to them and say, you know, well, you know, it's just 
will have a conversation unless I can share with them something in writing. That's what they want, they need, and ex should have about how the selection process will occur for not only the regional public interest environmental seat, but other seats if you're expanding the board. We, we don't have anything in writing about what your criteria was, how many seats you've decided to expand, how that changes the M MOU and how this and this goes to, you know, we need this conversation with ecology too, which is supposed to have a say in this. Tell you what, why don't you hold those topics to where we get to open forum? Because I want to stick to this topic and then I can address some of those uh, later on, if you don't mind. I don't know if I can stay the whole day. Well, if nothing else, I, I can answer some of those during a different time and then board can uh, relay responses back because I, I think I've got answers to all of that for you, but I want to stay on topic here. Right. OK, looking at. The draft work plan. And I've already had heard some of the comments on. Uh, meeting times and things like that. So I, I recognize there will be some change in there. So uh, the format that you're looking at is pretty much like what we have uh, for the current year. Some tweaks along in there as we go along. But uh, uh, Ruth, if, if you'll scroll down to page three, it's actually the top of, of page three, and then we get into the beginning of the calendar. Let's see. Yes, right there. So you see the concept for right there, middle of the page where it says presentation meetings, uh, which I just spoke about. And, and like I said, I, I expect there to be some comment on this. We got some comment from the uh, uh, wrap yesterday. So I, I would imagine that, that there will be some tweaking to this and which is why Bob is getting a uh, a uh, word document so that he can uh, collect comments on there. But basically presentation meetings that we want the public to attend will be from 5 to 730 uh, every other month. Uh, if it if it turns out to be successful, you know, maybe we might even do it more often than that. Uh, if it turns it turns out that that we don't get a whole lot then maybe we'll relook at this in the next year after that. But we're at least going to try. Uh, one of the things we don't do very well as an organization as as a whole is uh, bring a lot of, of public there and, and we really want to change that. Board meetings, as, as you see, looking at uh, uh, splitting things out a little bit. However, based on some of the comments that maybe uh, the presentation and then the work meeting being a month apart may not work as well. Uh, so that that's an item that I've already gotten uh, feedback on. So we'll, we'll take a look at that and which is why I'm looking forward to tank waste uh, red line uh, comments. Committee of the whole looking at quarterly. Uh, and and for, for the near term, uh, committees are going to remain in virtual format with board meetings being hybrid. The reason for that is two. One, we're trying to figure out how to do a really good facilitated meeting in hybrid, which is far different from trying to do classes or uh, uh, meetings like that. Uh, we think we have a path forward. We've got folks coming into Richland next week to look at venues and, and how we do that, get some lessons learned from the other boards on how they're doing that. We think we have a path forward, but we're going to start small so we can go big. So we're going to try it out with a couple of smaller meetings before we then open up the doors to go, uh, go big. We don't yet know what that answer will be, and we're trying to figure that out. We also know it's going to be a lot more expensive. So until we get a handle on those expenses and we're able to do uh, facilitated meetings regularly and do them well, we're going to remain small. Uh, so that board meetings right now will be the only hybrid meeting 
If we figure it out and it turns out to not be uh, horribly expensive and we can get through it, it will require a lot more effort uh, on the back end with facilitation to uh, work through. Uh, if, if it looks like we can do it sooner, then maybe we can get committee meetings into a hybrid format. But as of now, we're continuing to look at uh, committee meetings remaining in virtual format. Uh, Ruth, if you can scroll on down a little bit more. Uh, do, the we concept. Do a, we do have a question from Bob. OK, Bob, I'm sorry. Go are, for you, it, Bob. are you on? Are you on the, the timing? Uh, yes, I am. I'm. Uh, just want to ask some questions. It says presentation meetings. Uh, will be conversational. Uh, this morning we had a conversational meeting with Tom and Delmar, and that was excellent. Is that the concept you have for for the five to seven thirty, where people can ask questions and get answers? Yes, that that so that is really what's missing. And we're trying to trying to insert that into the schedule so that people can ask questions of senior management or our subject matter experts during those during that time. So yes. So it'll be less presentation like we've had in the past, where uh, the leaders kind of lay out what they've accomplished uh, and tell us about their successes. It'll be more minimal slides and a lot more discussion. Is that the concept there? Trying to get away from death by PowerPoint. Yes, thank you. Um, and then committee meetings, it says um, normally one to four. So are we limiting ourselves just to afternoons? Uh, that, that is, like I said, trying to go from uh, uh, full day to two half days. We'll see how it works. If 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 it doesn't work, then like you said, that this is a um, this is a flexible schedule. We we can change that. It's trying to open it up to allow more people to come who can't sit through entire days. Um, if if it works, great. It's something that that's a score. If it fails miserably, we will. Relook at it. Like I said, this is a conversation starter. Okay, because there, are, if uh, the pick, the wrap, all the committees want to have meetings like this week, uh, it would be very hard just to have them in the afternoons. I would think it should be flexible enough for one committee to meet in the morning and one in the afternoon. Uh, also, when I look at the calendar, <laughs> Ruth. You're going to need help. Actually, <laughs> I will admit that I may have put in a request for <laughs> additional staff because hybrid, as good as Josh is, Josh and I cannot alone do that calendar. Because there's a lot more meetings here that are going to require agendas and and support. So... So that needs to be in, taken into account too. Yeah, we are in conversation with DOE as to how to support that. I haven't talked about it for 24 hours. Okay. Well, let, let's see uh, if we can scroll up a little bit more. I can start to flesh out the, the vision that we have here. So if, if we stop there. Uh, if, if you think back to the, the calendar that we had with the six board meetings, what we're kind of looking at is starting off with with the typical DOE EPA ecology updates and try to get those more in a conversational uh, format. Uh, then we're, we'll throw in an additional topic that maybe can be considered a Hanford 101 or an update for a program that is mature or maturing, uh, that's had some, some uh, updates or things like that, where people can ask their questions, just like what we had this morning. And that's the, the desire. 
What I'm also trying to do is map things out a little bit so that there's some predictability uh, to the schedule, uh, particularly if there's somebody who has a particular interest in a topic. Uh, that way they can make sure that their calendar is cleared for that particular date. Uh, and, and, and I expect that, that some of these topics will move a little bit. Uh, like a, a year in accomplishment might be better in December. Because uh, we'd be talking potentially talking about fiscal year accomplishments as opposed to calendar year accomplishments. That might be one change. We're also looking at trying to get some of our contractors in to talk a little bit more about their scope of work that they're doing because, you know, CPC Co covers a lot of ground out on site and HMIS covers the entire site, but they are less visible because they're more infrastructure related. So uh, HMIS hits almost everything and, and uh, HPMC, uh, they provide a lot of our occupational health and, and some of the training and things like that. So they've got some good stories to tell as well. So we want to give these folks an opportunity to get in and tell their story. And, and it's also kind of the one Hanford dynamic that we're looking at where everybody has a piece of, of the pie and a piece of the puzzle. So if you can scroll down a little bit more, please, Ruth. Uh, scheduling, of course, I've, I've got that thrown in for our work meetings. And like I said, this, this is... Uh, something that I'm expecting will change some. The only thing that we do not have scheduled right now is we are going to do a member orientation and we don't yet have that scheduled because that will be dependent upon when the package will be approved. Uh, and, and if you remember last year, we had highest hopes that uh, we were going to be able to do things on October 19th and that didn't work out so well for us and we used something else in the place because we already had uh, that time uh, set up and then we did our new member orientation just before the board meeting in december so what we're trying to do is that's the only unscheduled work time uh, and and we'll figure it out as we go if you look at April 19th, I'm trying to uh, schedule in some time for a site tour. We're also trying to do a site tour this summer for the board, uh, potentially during the June meeting. Uh, still working on that to try to, to pull it all together. Uh, when we actually can make it work, we'll let the board know in plenty of time so that Everybody can make their arrangements and it might even be just a special day apart from meetings that we do that uh, more to follow on that. Uh, if you could scroll down a bit more, please, Ruth, on committee of the whole meetings, as you see, we've got it uh, kind of scheduled out a little bit for quarterly and those will be uh, notice. I don't have any topics except for the cleanup priorities advice for February 9th. Uh, the thought is that all of the committees will have met prior to that date and will have some input to the annual priorities advice. And then that will be an opportunity uh, for uh, folks to get together and hammer out final advice points so that it can be presented at the next board meeting after that. Uh, scroll a little bit more, please, Ruth. And what I've done here is this is, is primarily uh, looking at potential topics for the committees for the year. That way we can kind of, of uh, uh, once again, have some predictability about what we're going to discuss. Uh, so that people can arrange schedules as necessary. I'm sure that there's probably going to be some opportunities for some joint meetings and we can arrange things well in advance to do that. Uh, and, and we're trying to make these topical and conversational. Same thing that we're trying to do throughout. So that's going to be one of the big themes for uh, 
2023, starting in October, is move away from presentations and have more conversations. My understanding is that's kind of the way it was in the past, and we're trying to get back to that so that, uh, you know, we, we, we have better dialogue as we go along. And, and if you'll scroll down a little bit more, uh, please, Ruth. And the same basic uh, theme applies through the rest of the committee meetings. Uh, it, the executive issues committee, we, we've got those dates in. And, and as you saw on the calendar, those are uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, the flesh colored or salmon colored, probably more flesh colored. Uh, those dots are in there and those will be to discuss basically whatever issues uh, will pop up at the time that uh, whatever we want to do with that. Now, if you scroll down to the work plan section, uh, th this is kind of where we're expecting some discussion. Uh, we have some proposed topics based uh, predominantly on what's existing now and looking at how does that mesh with the five year plan and some of the near term uh, projects that we're looking at. And, and as you can see with with Tank Waste Committee. We're actually also trying to broaden the categories because most of these categories have a lot of meat within them. So don't think that just because there's five items on there that that's all we're talking about. Because no, that's not going to be the case. They you know, we're trying to put things within larger umbrellas, and uh, and you're going to have you know, as as the site matures and goes more toward operations, there's going to be just more progress updates that will be happening. Uh, there will be some news that will come out every now and then. As you know, the uh, test bed initiative is we're still in the discussion phase and permitting phase and, and all of that. And we're looking at, at uh, once all of that paperwork goes through and we actually are able to uh, uh go through with with the 2000 gallons we'll have something more to talk about uh also you know other priorities going on at the time uh, tank integrity we were trying to do a, an annual update with that uh as we go along uh df law of course obviously that that's something that this committee is is keenly interested in and we want to have some regular drum beats uh, and Tom is committed to being available as we come through. And we'll probably do a couple of different flavors of DF law uh, because what Tom did basically was kind of an overview of what's going on, but uh, there may be some new folks in uh, depending on, on the packet that they have no clue what DF law is. So we'll probably take it back a step and do a DF Law 101. What is it? What do you do? What are the benefits of it? You know, simplify that down a little bit. So th this is the spot, Bob, where I'm, I'm hoping that we get some good comments. I don't want to add a laundry list uh, to what we have here because, frankly, we can't cover it. Uh, now, if, if you add a dozen items on there, we're probably going to get through five or six of them. So uh, if you want to put some sub bullets underneath uh, some of the things that you have there to kind of flesh out what it is you're interested in, uh, we, we can uh, uh, see how that works with, with uh, the subject matter experts and scheduling and things like that. But uh, as, as we go through, and I think you've pretty much seen the meat and potatoes of the uh, uh, work plan there. Uh, Ryan, do, do you have anything that, that you want to add at this point? Uh, no, thanks. Yeah, like I said, we're we're just continuing to evaluate the work plan on the college's end. So we'll be we'll be I know we'll be incorporating our comments with with you and EPA when we uh, meet up to discuss this. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, Bob, looks like you've got a question. Yes, uh, the one thing I don't see is how do we handle emerging issues? Like last year, we had the uh, the leaking single shell tank, and 
that wasn't on our plan that we had put together. So there's nothing in here that says emerging issues and how we get that onto the schedule. Good question. And like I said, the, the schedule is flexible uh, to be able to address any emergency emerging issues uh, that uh, might come up. Uh, and, and because those you cannot predict, uh, it, it, it's going to happen when it happens, if it happens, and uh, th then we will interrupt our, our, our uh, schedule, insert what we need to, and then pick up uh, where we can. So there so is flexibility. Do we, do we need some words in the, the plan here to make sure we can, we can add those in a, a organized process? Uh, make that part of your comment. Okay. And, and uh, I don't know if we've got time to go through redlining like like we did yesterday because it looks like we're actually just we're actually over on break. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know we've got open forum and committee business. Uh, okay. So you now we we've got options. So if 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 Ruth wants to boss me around a little bit. Well, I, what I have is the 2022 work plan uh, topics that I took to last year's leadership work, uh, workshop. And as I glance down the list, they're all still current and uh, probably need need to be discussed and you know see if that's going to be something we want to put on the 2023. Um, I also see holistic negotiations on there from last year. So, and that hasn't changed. So, um, I don't know how to go through all these, uh, Ruth. Um, how do you want to, how would you propose? Uh, I'd like to get input from everybody else, and I'll just check off my list if somebody brings it up. And then I'll follow up with things that that I have on my list, and we can figure out: is this something that we need to follow up on next year? Let's check in with committee members. Um, I haven't heard a lot from them, and then um, if if they want to deputize you um, and Susan to cross check with last year's work plan. Um, that's a that's a pretty straightforward. Okay. Answer, I think. Yeah, I'd like to hear what they have in their mind. But I don't. Let's hear some other voices about what you think. Want everybody speak at once? <laughs> Hi there. Um, well, Bob, you already said the holistics. I don't know if that's going to happen this year or next year, but let's make sure we save room. Okay. I wonder if there will be any follow-up from the recently passed advice where if the if we do end up seeing an SST leak response plan, if we want to dedicate any time to understanding what's in it and how it relates to the thoughts that we had. Um, and maybe that gets folded under tank integrity or something like that, because as Gary said, those are uh, fairly broad. So, yeah, some of these topics that you want to add, you you put as a bullet underneath some of the uh, uh, broader topics that might probably be appropriate, and check them off as as we get through them, or not through them. All right. Are we sorry? One last thing. Okay. You know, originally today was going to be, or I guess the, this week was going to be a joint discussion with RAP where we were going to get into the models and how they relate to tank closure and, you know, dispositioning of soils and all of that. 
is there opportunity to have those kinds of discussions? Um, Potentially. OK, and then I don't know when when are we going to see the AAX farm start going through its process? Are we still years out from seeing the weir and the closure documentation? I know there's already a preliminary performance assessment for that farm out. I just wonder when we're going to see that process move and if tank closures are in our scope already. Yeah, I see it. OK. It, it may be one of those things where you got to time it for when things are ready to be talked about. And similarly with Sea Farm, you know, it's been in process for four years now. So. But broad categories are fine. I think it's the getting to the meeting by meeting when topics are ready to be discussed. It's going to really be the tricky part. And a comment that I made. Uh, <laughs> at one of the two committees, um, they're running together in my head. Um, the the calendar is has a lot of of committee week board meeting things that are two weeks apart, um, and our our current scope has meeting agendas going out two weeks before a meeting. Yeah, I know it didn't work last week, but that's the idea. And meeting minutes due two weeks after meetings, with the new proposed schedule. Um, we will probably do some form of either staffing up or expanding the, those to three week intervals so that we're not trying to get out agendas in the middle of committee week for a board meeting that's two weeks later. Um, there's there's a little bit of cadence we're going to have to work on to make that work. Jerry. Thanks. Um, uh, Jeff started down the path as he often does thinking of what uh, articulating what I, something I thought was missing. So thank you, Jeff. Um, on, you know, David Bowen said that the leak response was likely to be a permit mod. And it seems to me that this is a huge follow up to our board advice and that it's something that we would probably want to be doing as advice, not just information in terms of planning. Um, it's going to be. It'd be a comprehensive major policy input for huge portion of that's missing from the Hanford site permit. Um, so I just want to flag that as. You know. Yeah, and as you put in the bullet beneath leak response there or whatever. Um, and um, I, I want to point out in terms of how some of things things could work, like a permit hearing, like last night's LERF permit hearing and ETF seems to me like it would be was a perfect opportunity to do what we're talking about for an evening meeting. The presentation was very good. The discussion was very good. It fits perfectly with what I think you're hoping for evening meetings leading to topics that are on the board agenda and when they overlap. Now, obviously, that's not the case for a lot, you know, 75% of RICFR permit mod twos, but when there is a major issue, I think it would behoove us to look at this model and say a presentation and discussion like happened last night as part of this plan and tying it into when there is information or advice coming. Um, doing both at the same time would be really, I think, beneficial for the public. Just doing one meeting would be beneficial for the agencies and was very informative. Uh, I have to go to a faculty meeting, so I have to jump off. Thanks, Jerry. I appreciate your comment. Other comments from folks we haven't heard from?
So I'm going to invite you to, oh, Steve Wigman. Yes, jump in. I guess I had to say something, didn't I? Um, <clears throat> my curiosity is this, this change creates quite a spread of meetings. And uh, I'm curious how easy it's going to be to change if we need to evolve it during the year. One of the challenges I've had as a retired person is scheduling my year around the HAB schedule, which doesn't work real good. And this makes it way more challenging. And I'm curious, through, um, one of the big issues I've had over the years is, is not necessarily the schedule so much as changes to the schedule. So I'm, I'm looking at this thinking, I bet you're going to be making some changes. And maybe it's just a alert of issues that we still have to face but you know we're we're putting out a, a schedule for the entire year with some expectation that it will change i'm wondering if there's any way you can do a front-end perspective on the year and then seal the rest of it later but you know you've got a you've got a process you have to go through Sure, Steve, uh, good question. And I know that I will not hit the 100% mark with this. I don't even think I'll hit the 90% mark, but if, if we can come up with something that meets the needs of most of the board members and the public, and is also sustainable by staff, because that's also a huge consideration that uh, I need to look at uh, for as far as whatever pre-work needs to be done to prepare for the meetings, such as agendas and, and presentations and lining up uh, subject matter experts and such, and then the back end work of being able to produce notes and summaries and things like that in a, uh, a consistent manner and also uh, you know, as we go along, it's going to require more staff. So we're looking at how do we make that happen? Is as of now, there's one Ruth, there's one Gary. Uh, so so that's two limiting factors there. And then, uh, you know, we're we're looking at a a variety of things. But uh, as as I started off, this is the conversation starter. And I'm fully expecting as we go through and, and look at feedback and, and things that people have said some things that uh, I'm already looking at making some changes that by the EIC, you might see some changes and and add more feedback in by the time we're looking at the leadership conference, uh, the leadership conference. And it might change again uh, by the time we vote on it in uh, June. So, yeah, th this is a, a fluid process right now, Steve, and uh, I appreciate your comments. Well, I've certainly listened to the conversation and got some ideas from that. But I, I would comment that from my perspective, uh, I'm still absorbing. So I appreciate the conversation. I'm actually you, sir. looking at, at doing cross training facilitation training for staff um, in multiple places so that there's some depth. Um, the week I ended up flat on my back and we had committee calls was a was tough on a lot of people and I don't want I don't want to recreate that anytime again ever. So Ruth, um, since I, I think we heard from most of the people, um, I'd like to just kind of go down my list very quickly and make sure these are still things that we're interested in. So under the first one, the direct feed law activity waste, uh, that is that is the, the mission of the site right now. And uh, the discussion we had, and in the path, past, we were looking at uh, critical path updates and how, how we do that. If we have a conversation, presentation like we had this morning, that'd be great. Uh, Liz brought up the fact that we uh, 
the mass balance flow sheet and uh, off gas and all that. Uh, Liz, were you happy with that or do we think we need more information on that? It might be nice to include it as a sub bullet just to make sure. I, I think it's just, it's going to become, I, I appreciate the presentation today or in Tom's response that it's something that is a guess. Okay. I don't think we've gotten that clear of an an answer so far that so I think we'll need to, you know, be on top of it to keep asking about it as things start so we start to see how does the guess pair up with reality. Um, is that okay. part of commissioning or part of operations? Uh, I think well it's probably both. Yeah. yeah. I think I it's think. uh something they have to do ahead of time, but then they need to keep updating it based on uh, the operations and what they find. So I left that on the list. Uh, I see a hand up. Uh, who is that? It's Chris. Chris. Yeah, Bob, you might consider putting as a bullet in there process control. As we heard this morning, there are 25 individual activities that have to be going on simultaneously. So how they're going to maintain process control to ensure consistent and constant throughput with all those 25 different activities, I think is a critical aspect of operations and would make a good discussion. And it would okay. tie in, for example, to the mass balance that uh, that Liz has been concerned about. Okay. okay. So are we lumping or splitting here? Um, what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be difficult, although it sounds like this. If the idea is to have broader categories that you can have many things under, if you build this out to be really, really long, how are you yeah. balancing lumping and splitting? Yeah, I have uh, several well, more under here, too. Uh, one one of them was a subset of process control. Yeah. I'm sorry, I what, missed what? you. Mass balance would be a, a subset of process control. <clears throat> I am I am not that technical. Steve Wigman. Yeah, you know, all of these are extremely interesting topics. My my caution is we're supposed to be at the policy level. And one of the challenges we have is we delve into the weeds to the point where we don't have policy level discussions. And a lot of the new members aren't going to understand or care about mass balance and process control and the, the myriad of things that I'm interested in that aren't even on the list, but I'm not putting them on the list because they're in the weeds. I would just caution that somehow we've got to evolve ourselves to a uh, higher level of, of observing what's going on so that we can produce meaningful pro, uh, policy level advice. I don't know how best to do that. So the question that runs through my mind when we're doing agendas is how much in the weeds do you need to go so you can successfully back up the policy? And, and I think that the challenge is because I really like you know, the, the weeds are kind of fascinating, right? <laughs> Except that, I mean, they are. That's the why nerd. we're there. Um, <laughs> the nerd. But, but taking three giant steps back and saying, why do I need to understand mass balance so that I can I can say something intelligent about policy or, or what I care about as a member of the public or a representative of this other organization? Um, so the question is, why does the committee need that level of detail in order to support its work? Not just because it's a really cool topic. Yeah, plus we're, we're trying to get more public interest. And most of the public that I know of doesn't think at this level. 
I've got Liz and Gary and Chris. Liz. Thanks. Um, just a note on the mass balance. I mean, I think mass balance, the word sounds technical, but the only reason I know about it is because we had conversations on as part of the HAB and Vince brought it up. And just, I think it's, it is the policy level accessible idea is knowing what you have, you know, this is, these are all the contaminants we have. And we're going to about to put them through the system and this is where they end up. I think that's a pretty important policy um, level issue of like knowing where all your stuff ends up after it goes through these complex treatment processes and knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty in it. Um, so being able to ask that question, I feel like that's like a nice uh, overlap of the technical and the policy to me. And I wouldn't even have known to flag it if we hadn't had that balance of technical and you know, kind of pulling those policy threads out of this complex cleanup, um, at least for that issue, I think is, and maybe it, it's part of a bigger, you know, maybe there's a, a different way to bin those concerns. Um, and I know, I mean, I've worked on so many different work plans over the years of how we, you know, how we bin things. Um, and maybe there's a place to be tracking these issues so that we make sure we get them on there. Or, or another thing we talked about at RAP yesterday was, you know, so so if direct feedlot activity waste gets split between two meetings and there's different DFLAW topics on those two days, you you know what you're going to put in those conversations and some of the framing questions you'd be asking. And I think that's where that detail helps build that agenda um, so that Gary can get the right people there. Thanks. I have Gary, Chris, and Jeff. Gary. Yeah, let me go on and, and kind of help out with that because uh, uh, you know how successful the uh, discussion was this morning with with uh, Tom Delmar and Janet. That's pretty much the level of discussion that we're going to have going forward, where it's the big picture. Uh, where they, we also have the people in there who can reach down and touch the weeds, but aren't going to live in the weeds. Uh, so they, they uh, presented at, at pretty much the level that we're trying to get to, where they use, you know, broader terms uh, so that those who have a, a collection of PhDs aren't insulted and those of us who don't have that amount of education or have a different level of education can follow on. So that, that's kind of something to think about. Uh, we're not going to do technical. You know, ju just not going to happen anymore. Uh, th this is this is not a technical advisory board. It's a uh, it's a discussion. Uh, there, there's going to be the opportunity to ask some technical questions, uh, and th there will be some ways to be able to get out additional information. But that's not really the direction that we're trying to go. It's to uh, it's to enable the uh, board to be able to go out and talk to uh, its constituency where folks understand. So we'll be able to address some of the technical, but we're not going to have technical discussions. Uh, if if you understand if uh, I said that properly, Chris and then Jeff. From my experience in operations, process control, throughput, continuity are the essential drivers of of operations, especially something like this. And if you don't understand, if you don't have some basic facts about those, then you can't form policy. Um, without an, an understanding of, of what the drivers of operations are, especially operations that are going to span 50 some odd years. You have to understand the underlying drivers. Then you can formulate policy advice on a non-technical level. But you have to understand, I, I firmly believe you have to understand what, what drives operations because it's different than what drives a project, which has a, a beginning and an end. And 
and it's different. You have different management processes. It requires a different mindset. And as we heard this morning, it's a completely different culture. And if you don't understand that culture, you don't understand the drivers, then you can't formulate, in my mind, you can't formulate valid process, uh, policy. So that's why I put, I thought, an understanding of how they want to maintain process control would be a good discussion. And it may or may not result in a policy advice, but it gives us a fundamental understanding. Yeah. Steve, I appreciate you plucking this string. It's good to have these conversations. Um, we talked about it quite a bit at the pick on Monday as well. Um, this concept of having access to technical information. Um, in simple terms, something that I think is of interest when you ask for the mass balance is the ability to trace the doobads and make sure that none of them escape. Um, I think that's really important to be able to tell that story. And similarly, organics in tank waste could be a grout spoil. So when we're trying to make the policy decision, do we go the grout path or not? It's really important to know where you, your doobads are and where your organics are to know if it's actually a good path or not. Um, you know, and I'll say transparency to me means you can ask for what you want to know and have a reasonable expectation that that's going to be provided to you. And I see the HAB as a valuable portal for not only us as members, but members of the public to find access to the information that they need. And I think that it's important to keep that portal active. Um, last thought is if I can't stand behind something technically, as technical staff for the state of Oregon, then I can't stand behind it and endorse it to my constituencies. And so for me, having that ability to stand behind something technically is really important because one of my key policy concerns is how well uncertainty is managed and how well supported are the decisions that are being made on the site. In order to to feel that those policy interests are satisfied, I do need access to that kind of information. So, you know, it's always a balance of how deep we go and how much time we spend, but there there is some importance there. And again, thanks for plugging. Dan. Yes, on the same subject, and, and, and um, Chris kind of rattled my brain on that, as, as, as did Jeff. If if the grouting doesn't happen, then we'll be building another uh, low activity waste treatment plant. And so uh, having a, a good technical understanding of the first plant that would be able to able enable us to offer policy level advice on building the second plant. Thank you. Steve Wigman. Well, yeah, I, I don't disagree with anything you guys are saying. I'm I'm thinking of the non-technical members. And if I'm a non-technical member and I see the word process control, my brain's going to shut off. So maybe we need to find some art of plain talk language to use on some of these topics so that it invites non-technical members to want to listen but it still leaves the opportunity for technical members to probe deeper. Um, I don't know how best to do that, but there used to be a thing called the Art of Plain Talk, which was designed to help communicate with people who weren't lawyers or technoids. Um, I don't know the best language to use in these cases, but it might be worth delving into that a little bit. I actually spend a fair amount of time explaining things in non-technical language to new people. Chris. Okay, instead of process control, what if we said maintain repetitive, repetitive tasks or re repetitive operations over 50 years. How do we maintain 
how do we maintain consistent repetitive operations or something like that and get rid of the words process control? So does that need to be in the work plan or is it enough part of operations that for a work plan it works and for tactical agenda development we need something else? Well, I guess what I was trying to do, and maybe what Liz was trying to do with mass balance, is trying to put a little bit more context in operations. And operations is a is a pretty broad term and and encompasses a whole bunch of things. So I think more of what we we're trying to do is 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 maybe put a little context in it, uh, rather than having so something a word so broad, it, it it's almost it's almost so general as to be almost meaningless. So I guess that was the purpose of saying, you know, process control initially. But if we can find another another set of words that would be less engineering and in context, uh, I'm fine with that. Or we would, yeah. So that's where I'd like to go. A term we used to use in the utility business was continuity of operations. And that let us delve into anything that affected that stability. I'm good with that. Okay, what I'm hearing is, uh, and what I have on my list, there's a whole pile of them that are under continuity of operations, if that's what we're going to call it. The mass balance, the process control, um, operations at IDF, how things are going there, the waste verification process, how do you verify you made good glass uh, and that, that it met the IDF waste verification. Um, the DFW um, recovery mode process plans and priorities are on the list. Uh, and so those are all things I think I would lump under continuity of operations. And, and they really become framing questions. Th these would be things I would put under uh, that general topic and say, can you, we're interested in these items. So uh, Gary would a be able to find the, the right guy to come talk to us that, that knows, could answer our questions. And so we're not asking for a, a presentation, a technical presentation on that topic. Those are just things that we may ask questions about. So those are all under things that I have under operations. Uh, the, the other thing I have is uh, the Tisker resin canister disposition, which we have brought up several times. And that's, that's more, uh, We'll have to find a spot for that. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then integrity testing of site transfer lines. Those are things that are probably in the commissioning area. And so under those two categories, I think I could go through and lump most of these things that we're asking about and uh, as as sub subtopics so when we do get the right person to talk to us they'll have more information on what we're looking at does that make sense to you gary yes and, and i was thinking that some of those questions you had the right people in front of you this morning okay so that part of what i'm trying to do is as we go more toward conversation is have the right people who can handle a broader range of question. And not only will we get the right guys, we've got some extremely talented women on staff too. 
and they'll be included in the conversation. But uh, uh, that's that's the whole point of trying to shift it to more of a conversational rather than a presentational is to be able to have the latitude to answer a lot of those questions. OK, I've, I've got two process thoughts. Um, one is behind the scenes, there's st there's still a requirement that each committee have actually both a topics table and a committee work plan, which I keep trying to meld into the same document, but only one committee actually uses it. Um, it is possible to come up with a committee work plan or a committee list of framing questions, if you will, so that, that underneath this have work plan is that subset for this committee where that becomes the the holding bin for Bob's list and framing questions so that there's a place that anybody can go and say these are the things that that the committee's typically worried about when you're talking about Tisker phones. Um, the other thing that used to happen in truly ancient times is um, the facilitator would actually work with the Gary person and brief presenters or, or people who were leading conversations, SMEs, before meetings and say, these are the kind of questions you can expect to get. Um, because either we would have a work plan or we would just know because we'd heard you say it that many times. And we'd say, don't walk into that meeting without knowing they're going to ask you how much this is going to cost or what the schedule slide was because of the COVID hit or whatever. And so you you prep the SMEs to think about stuff before they came into the, the meeting room and, and they'd be better prepared to answer what's on your mind. So there are, there are a couple ways to get to that next level down from this to capture framing questions where we can all get them because we're not sitting on Bob's desk looking over his shoulder at his list just as we're not sitting on Gary's desk looking over the shoulder at his list. And when we don't know what are on those both of those lists, eh, it can be a source of confusion. So um, if if you're going to send me. I think I already have it uh, with the information that we sent out before the meeting, should I just add my topics and what I heard this morning to that list so we can uh, and maybe lump them together in commissioning operations or whatever categories I can come up with. Uh, I do have uh, the A AX tank farm retrieval, which is uh, yes on there. Um, and then we, we still have the grout issues that are being worked on, the test bed initiative, which is a, a grout issue. And then on the list, it says conditions under which grout at Hanford is acceptable, which, which is on my list from before. Um, and then somewhere, maybe it's under site cleanup priorities, I have the emerging issues. How do we handle that? And uh, I also have the high level waste definition. Because uh, last year about this time, I think uh, a GAO report or somebody came out saying you're going to save this much money at Hanford because of the new definition of high level waste. And that just kind of went away. And we were going to ask how they came up with that uh, $300 million savings, but we never got there. Um, tank integrity, I have a response to our leak response advice 311. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we're going to have to talk about that when it comes, we get that. Um, tank integrity, I know that the organization is looking at that and they could be briefing us on all the good things they're doing there. Uh, and then there's all these, how do you know when a tank is list, 
uh, failing? How do you increase confidence that the tanks won't fail? And how do you know when a double shell tank fails? So there's a whole pile under tank integrity I also have. Uh, system plan 10 is, uh, we started that discussion today and uh, they said that they would be willing to come back and talk to us when they figure out what the uh, scenarios are. And so there's, there's things I can, bullets I can add that are on our list. Uh, and I would think the composite analysis and the cumulative impacts evaluation, those are all things that are perfect for committee of the whole type activities. Also the waste management C. So I think those should go into the list of the committee of the whole. So I think if people, if I took my list, put them in here, and then we send them out to to the committee to have them look at it. Would that get us uh, a step closer to having a better command of what's on, what are these topics mean? Gary? Actually, uh, almost everything that you mentioned is something that could, instead of putting it on a list, uh, would probably wind up being addressed at with within uh, uh, many of the different conversations. But yeah, go on, just put them on it on his list. That's not a problem. Yeah, it just be sub bullets to your list that you're that you're showing. Go for it. Comments from the committee. Uh, just one uh, in consideration of the new in, in, in uh, joined say in November. In November, would there be a chance to to, to review that with the new people so that they can get a they can get a foot in if they are hand in if they wanted it. Yeah, they should be uh, seeing it when when the uh, the. Uh, Work plan comes to them uh, for approval, whatever date that might be. And we don't have another meeting until August. Is that right? Yeah. Correct. So the, wow. the EIC proposed that the draft tab work plan, which is what you're looking at, get input from the committees this week, go to the May leadership workshop, which are the TPA agencies and the EIC. That group comes up with the draft work plan to present to the full board, which is the third, <coughs> excuse me, the third week in June. And even though traditionally the work plan has been adopted in the, at the September board meeting, because of the uncertainty about around when the next round of appointments are going to be made, um, the EIC was thinking adopting the FY23 work plan in June was a safer mm -hmm. option so that when those appointments happen, there's a framework for continuing work and we don't end up in limbo if the board couldn't adopt something at its September meeting. So. The idea is for the next iteration of this to go to the EIC at the leadership workshop and then to the June board meeting for adoption. So the newly appointed members actually wouldn't see it. Well, they could if they dialed into the June half. Meeting. But officially as members, they wouldn't see it until after they were. Appointed. Well, is there a way to, to notify them? Every, everybody that's, that's got to pack it in that, that, and then it's not a member now, notify them of the times of, of these meetings and 
what the topics will be? Yeah, I mean, last year what we did was when the packet went in, we added all of the proposed new members to the board list and they got they got notices of all the committee meetings and all the board meetings. The good news was they got the information. The challenge was we really confused them because we were giving them information except that they didn't have appointments. And so it, it made it hard for them to differentiate when can I participate and when can I observe. And that was just a price of, of sharing information. It wasn't that we didn't want to, but we did spark a chunk of confusion. And once the uh, calendar is adopted, it's going to be posted on the HAB website anyway. So it will be available to the public and any member, any prospective member can look at it there if, if they don't happen to have uh, their copy in front of it. So it, it will be shared uh, and uh, uh, we want widest dissemination as possible. OK, thank you. So my suggestion is as you as you think through this and, and something wakes you up, you know, over your evening adult beverage tonight, um, get with Bob or Susan with your ideas, your suggestions, your questions, so that they can take that to the leadership workshop. Bob? Bob? We can't hear you. Oh, got to push the button. <laughs> I, I should be working up a, a red-lined copy of the comments I heard today, uh, or would I just add it to what the wrap did yesterday? What What's easier? Separate. That way you don't have comments all over each other. Okay. And we, we can reconcile uh, as we go through. Okay, because I know you've probably got a whole pile of comments from each one of these uh, discussions. Hopefully a lot of them were the same. So, and then the, the goal would be to take this to next, is it next month? Next month's uh, leadership workshop. Okay. Are there other topics that this committee wants brought up at the leadership workshop in addition to the work plan and calendar. Other things you want the agencies and the EIC to, to work on, discuss, resolve. I guess I'd like to hear more discussion about our, uh, our advice on membership. Uh, hopefully there'll be a response back from DOE or or some sort of agreement there uh, on what what our path forward is. So um, I'm sure that will be part of our discussion. I suggest we talk about your next meeting. We've we've kind of blown through open forum. <laughs> that yes, wasn't, that uh, wasn't the original concept, but <laughs> we kind of have. So, so you want to move on to our August meeting agenda? Um, Mostly because I don't think it makes sense to take a break to come back and do that. Yes. Um, but I am also aware that we didn't take a break and at some point people will get a little brain tired. So, um, Gary, uh, August, 
that's probably too far away for you to to have anything laid out. Any plans? Yeah, come up with uh, two or three topics and let's see what we can fold together at that point. But as far as agenda building it, it's kind of difficult, but like I said, if, if you give uh, give us two or three topics that you're interested in, it'll give me some time to uh, work on it then. Yes, and we heard this morning that uh, from uh, Tom and uh, the others that it'd be about six months for another conversation. That's October time frame. And even the system plan 10 was uh, October or September time frame. So those are the next meeting. Uh, the, the main thing I still am looking for is a little more definition on how things are going on the TBI. Uh, I know there's the weirs done and they're pushing the all the regulatory paperwork. Is there something there that uh, the board might be able to help them with if we uh, if they're getting into a problem? I think that's right now primarily in the regulatory space. Uh, I I don't know. I I don't follow that one as closely as I can. What I can do is I'll just come up with a a couple of. Uh, two or three different topics that we can have for that because we're looking at primarily uh, since we're looking at a flex time and we may have reduced uh, uh, participation and uh, folks uh, whose who's, uh, appointments has, have lapsed or something like that. Maybe uh, just some good general information, uh, maybe a uh, Hanford 101 type of presentation along with something like that, something that is highly unlikely to generate any sort of uh, desire for advice or anything like that. Uh, so so I can I can think about uh, some potential topics. So do you have any idea when our leak, single shell leak advice might have a response? That'd be something we may want to discuss if that happens. I worked August. on on a, a draft of it during lunchtime, and it's going through review. And uh, uh, with, with my goal of of getting a response out within the next thirty to forty five days. So August might be a uh, time limit. Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know uh -huh. if uh, if that comes out, that's one thing the committee would like to talk about. Yeah, I, my goal may be one thing. Reality may be completely different. Okay. I've got Liz and Ryan in queue. Liz? Okay. Thanks, Ruth. Um, one topic that I can't remember which meeting I brought it up. I think it was at PIC. Um, there's a permit modification on the waste treatment plant high level waste facility, which I don't. If we could do something like we had today, where it was more of a conversation and we had the right people to talk about an update with the high level waste facility technical issue resolution process and pretreatment and other uh i know there's i can't remember where it was like the direct feed high level waste concept just starting to talk about like what what's out there on high level waste and timing even though it's far away it, it feels like it'd be helpful to get that update and have it be more conversational if that's a possibility because it and ecology might I, I I suggested to ecology to see if they might be able to do a let's talk about Hanford on that topic if it's easier for them to pull that together um, than DOE but and I think you are there for that um, conversation Gary um, but I think that would be interesting and especially if it could be framed if we have new members or like the one-on-one -on -one concept just like the bigger picture we have all this tank waste we need to treat it there's all these different things happening we did a deeper dive on DFAW today, but you know, maybe in August it can be that bigger picture. Um, and then the second thought I had was it just has come up in other committees that we might have some end state um, follow up or debrief that we want to do after the May 17th meeting that could come in August. We might want to talk earlier than that, but there might be things specific to tank waste and tank farms that comes out of that. That could be a topic for August. 
Brian. Thanks, Ruth. I think I'll first touch on uh, Liz's comment. Liz, I just we had some chat with our staff and I think uh, I, I know at some point what we do want to do a let's talk about Hanford involving WTP, but I think I think that's that's a topic we're going to probably have to hold out on a little bit until at least until those negotiations are wrapped up as well as the, the conversations that ecology is having with um, energy on on the path forward for 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 the for the tank. So I think that is a topic that's on our radar, but I think we just have to hold off a little bit um, until until that uncertainty is kind of cleared up with with all the different negotiations going on. Um, I also want to touch on TBI, uh, that topic. I know I'm a little late on that topic. Um, my understanding, just 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 for awareness, is is that, and, and Dan might be able to correct me if if I'm misspeaking here, is that the application, or is that our team, Ecology's team, stands ready, our permitting team's ready for the application from from DOE. But my understanding is that process is currently on DOE's court, and we're we're kind of just in a waiting phase on Ecology's end. Um, Dan might be able to offer some insight there. Yeah, Ryan, you're you're right. At this particular point, there was a a regeneration of interest on TBI, and DOE started to contact us for the second time concerning permit application. But in their management chain, that was pulled back. So at this particular point, I'm not aware of active interactions being considered for TBI until we're further along with direct feed low activity waste. Thanks, Dan. And I think that's all I had to share for now. But um, thanks for thanks for keeping me in the queue. Um, this committee retains its leadership over the packet gap time. Um, both Bob and Susan are in beginning their second year of their appointment, so they're they're not caught in that gap. Um, this is the only committee that doesn't have leadership caught in that gap, so. That's because we had it last year. <laughs> last year, right. And um, Susan has contacted me. Uh, I guess she has a lot of problems with uh, her husband's illness, and she's thinking about having to drop off the board so we may have to replace her also so um bob i just missed that who'd you say that was pardon me i was susan leckband our okay. vice chair thanks so uh okay so i have um potentially the single shell tank advice response uh committee a whole follow-up looks like the other two items on my list for august uh are probably not ready so um i guess we'll have to kind of follow it we have the whole summer <laughs> for uh for things to happen and for for gary to figure out what might be ripe for a uh, for briefing at that time. Uh, one thing we did have was the uh, effluent uh, waste facility. Uh, that was on a up for a presentation several months ago, and uh, we didn't touch on it today, but I, I guess I'd like to find out where that is in the, the process also. Uh, that was a presentation that I thought was ready to go a couple months ago. Yeah, that, that one, uh, the effluent management facility, that was something that we were looking to queue up. And then Bechtel was uh, getting so focused on going from its uh, loss of power to getting ready for melt or heat up. They just didn't have the bandwidth to support at that time. It's, it's a great news story. Uh, and uh, we're, we're getting closer to more things, turning the uh, on button. And, uh, you know, let's and, and I do want to kind of have a, a, uh, a waste treatment plant 101 overview that kind of goes through the entire plant and why it's important to the operation and, and things like that because 
over the years, we haven't really talked a whole lot about the balance of facilities. We've talked a lot about the uh, low activity waste facility. We've talked about uh, uh, tank farms and, and things like that, but we haven't really gotten into and, and uh, uh, a, a lot of the, uh, uh, I think there's what, 14 different facilities in there that you know all come together to make magic. And, and look, looking to at some point, have one of those discussions to kind of go through all of that. And it was on our work plan for 2022. Uh, it was DF law, in depth, end to end, waste to glass, and uh, how it operates. And Eric Coles was the the name on that. But since then, Eric's moved on to to, to the east. <laughs> so uh yeah he got the big job and and left left the rest of us uh, high and dry here uh it, it, i guess losing. if you could if you could uh, find someone else to do that that'd be outstanding yeah let, let's see it, it's still on my list as well as uh things we want to try to get to timing is is going to be an important thing and i'll just reach back to the folks folks at Bechtel and, and then see if they can support our team in, in doing that. So it, it's still on my list as well, Bob. OK. So we'll compare this next week, uh, next month at the leadership workshop and see where we stand. Got Liz OK. And you. I just wanted to share um, <clears throat> a few of us were at the LERF ETF and 242A evaporator public meeting last night that was about the permit modification for leak upgrades. Um, and it was a help, the Q&A was really helpful. People they had were just great at answering questions clearly. And one thing that was communicated, which I found helpful was um, that they're gonna know at any one point in time, what is going from either the evaporator or the waste treatment plant to the liquid effluent retention facility basins, um, because we were asking about how will you know if a leak monitor, if leak detection goes off, um, you know, what's in the pipes at any one time. And so it was just helpful to know, kind of get a description of how that works. Um, so there will, there's a recording of the meeting. So if you're interested, you can go, go back and listen to that. Um, and just from my point of view, it seemed like pretty straightforward adding new leak detection equipment. Um, that sounded like it was a great move. So just in case people missed it, I wanted to share that since we're not open forming. Thanks. So Ruth, it sounds like we'll need a committee call in uh, in June. Is that when they're scheduled? Yeah. OK, because there's nothing scheduled in July. OK. So do you want a, a committee call or just a committee leadership call? I, I, I think just call them gang of six, but I haven't come up with a new name for them. I think just a leadership call to set the agenda. Bottom of the list, Bob. So uh, we shot through the break and, and we're about a half hour early now. Uh, I guess I would open it up to an open forum if anybody has any additional topics they want to talk about. We also need to recognize some folks who are stepping off the board. Uh, who've been on for quite a while and, and who have been able to provide good service and, and 
uh, add to the conversation as we've gone along. Of course, I'm, I'm looking at Liz on, on uh, picture there. She'll be stepping off here soon. And I know that there's a, a few other folks who will be stepping off. So uh, and they'll be getting a, official letters uh, closer to the end of their appointment date in June. But uh, just want to say thanks to all of those with, with uh, what you've added to the uh, uh, ab over uh, your service. And we appreciate it and hopefully you will remain engaged as members of the public and also help us to mentor uh, the next generation of HAB members. And even though you don't sit on the board, you still have a voice and I bet you that there's an awful lot of people who will continue to listen to the sage advice and mentoring and uh, and knowledge that you have gained and, and want to share and, and pay that forward. So is there some way we can get a list of all the people that are that are leaving the board so we could kind of reach out and thank them? Yeah, we're doing something like that in June. OK, good. And since the silence is deafening, it's not a bad idea if you want to give people some time back. <laughs> you, you know, you mean, just, just just saying just because the agenda runs to four o'clock, you're not going to lose points if you, you know. <laughs> so just give saying, them a late break. <laughs> I guess, uh, Ruth, um, any other items that we need to cover? I I am at the bottom of my list. OK, so am I. So, hey, thank you. Uh, today was amazing. Uh, we had a, a very good conversation. And Gary, I would recommend that format for the future. Uh, a lot of our topics that we uh, as a committee we're interested in were were addressed and uh, I, I think they were if you would thank uh, Janet and Delmar and uh, Tom for us that that would be appreciated. They did a great job. So with that. 25 minutes early. Is that a, a new standard for the tank farms? Tank tank committee. <laughs> okay. So if there's nothing else, uh, thank you very much. Hi everybody. Bye everyone. Thank you.